This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in to this new podcast of VOIW International. Thank you for tuning in. The August edition, probably the late August edition. It's my hope, anyway, to get this program out before the month of August is through. Uh, but obviously, I mean, if it gets released in very early September, it, it just is what it is in the end. But I hope for it to be released in late August anyway. Hope everyone out there tuned in is feeling and doing all right. All right, a few things right off the bat. If you're tuned into this program on YouTube, three pieces of fan art I would like to feature in the program. Let's give credit where credit is due. The first piece of fan art goes out to Theory Fictions on Twitter. Uh, Also goes by the Instagram handle old underscore n3t. The second piece of fan art goes out to Baseotronics. And the third piece goes out to an anonymous listener. If you are tuned in and you're feeling a little bit artistically inclined, you're always welcome to design a piece of fan art. Have fun with it. And then if you'd like it featured in the next program that I do, it would certainly be my pleasure to showcase it. All you have to do is send in the piece of fan art to me via email at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And please let me know how you would like to be credited, Uh, be that by name, if you'd like a social media profile mentioned, a website mentioned, anything, uh, so folks can find more of your work. Or if you'd like to be anonymous, uh, make sure you let me know as well. As a default, I just say this just to let you all know that if no name is mentioned, uh, then obviously you'll be automatically anonymous, and that'll be that. So please let me know how you'd like to be credited. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, I want to play a couple ads just for some of the sponsors that help keep this program going. Creators After Dark is an inspirational podcast featuring new and underrated content creators. The show's storytelling format allows the guest to tell their story with minimal interruption. It's perfect for nighttime listening. After VORW, check out Creators After Dark. Tired of poor quality fashions that have to be thrown out after just one season? Ecocentric has the high-quality, trendy styles you're looking for. Shop their hand-picked vintage clothing and upcycled fashion accessories. Browse the wide selection of vintage and pre-loved clothing, that is much better than stores. Love the way you look and feel. It's the eco-friendly choice that makes our world a better place. All eco-centric items are pre-washed and ready to wear as soon as your package arrives. Easy online shopping and fast shipping with great customer service. Visit Ecocentric and save 15% off your choice of items for a limited time only Use the following coupon code at checkout, ECOCENTRIC15, that's E-C-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-K-15, at checkout. Remember, that's ecocentric.etsy.com, E-C-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-K dot Etsy, E-T-S-Y dot com, that's ecocentric, with a K, dot Etsy dot com. And on the final note, of course, if you would like to support this program, please consider a donation via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail dot com, or consider supporting the program at Patreon dot com slash the report of the week. So this program, by and large, is going to be a mailbag show. 
lot of emails that I want to get to, and definitely the vast majority of the show is going to be dedicated to that. Uh, really, I don't have too much to say on my own at this point in time. So one good thing is when you take a look at some of the emails that come in, that helps guide some of the conversation, and obviously it'll, it'll bring about some topics and questions and things to discuss and, and all of that good stuff. So in a few moments, I'll give out the email address, and I'll essentially uh, talk about how all of that stuff works, and then we'll get into that. On one other note, just as an update, if you've been tuned into this program regularly, which <laughs> at this point in time is really on a monthly basis, uh, you're well aware of the the whole issue that I've been talking about with the broadcasts that I do to North America. And let me tell you, the situation just wasn't improving at all. If anything, it was getting worse. And like I said, I'm not going to sit here and say things that I can't definitively prove, but something was going on. And it was detrimentally impacting this broadcast because the problem that I was having, mind you, in addition to doing this podcast, I do a radio show, and it's a totally different thing. But previously, before this month, I was doing it roughly five times a week. Four times to North America, and once to Europe. And each show is an hour long, and in it, I'll share my thoughts on various things. I'll play listener music requests, I'll talk about the songs... I'll talk about some current events and things going on in the world. And it winds up just being this, this I always call it, rather formally, a didactic mix of entertainment, of entertainment and information, though never blending the two. They're always distinctly separated. And anyway, th that show, I've been doing it since early 2015 at this point. But it's very well received. A lot of the radio listeners like it. And it, it just elicits many a positive reaction. It's a lot of fun to do. And uh, it's, it's freeing in a way, knowing at the very least that I can talk about things on the radio and I don't have to worry about online algorithms or censorship getting in the way of things. And that's just a relief, because things can get real crazy, and uh, it's just nice to know that at least I could just share my thoughts on whatever I want to, and I don't have to feel like I'm ever walking on eggshells or any of that. And I choose to broadcast this show on shortwave, not only because I personally like the medium, uh, but because the shortwave audience out there is one that really wouldn't be reached by what I do online. And, uh, again, it's just a program that's very well received. By that I mean both literally and figuratively. People enjoy the show, and, again, before a few months ago, people could pick up the show with a clear signal on their radios. And then starting... So I was doing things consistently, and it was fine. But then, in June, all of a sudden everything changed. And the same station, same transmitter, same frequency, same everything. All of a sudden, the quality, the signal strength, by that I mean, of my show, just plunged off a cliff. And it, con it continued for weeks and weeks and weeks. And a station that used to get a strong signal of my show out to listeners across North America, all of a sudden the signal was barely heard by anyone. So with that, of course, if people can't pick up the broadcast, then they're not going to be able to listen to the show. 
And when this problem continued so consistently, the listening audience dwindled considerably because even if folks wanted to listen, they no longer could because they couldn't receive the signal. And week after week, most of the feedback that would come in from people who even managed to hear anything were just saying, you know, the signal's really weak, it's really static riddled, uh, I could barely hear what you're saying, I can't really discern anything, etc. And one problem after the next, after the next, and then, you know, you have to ask yourself, what am I putting all of this time and effort into? And I was paying for the airtime as well. So I was paying for this. And this is the outcome? You're doing all of this for nothing, and you're, li- you're burning your money. So I mentioned in the last show that I was considering doing some cutbacks. Well, I decided to take a more drastic approach. I thought to myself, look, I could sit here, but is it going to change the situation? Is it really going to make things better? Because nothing has at this point, and it has been months. And the station seemingly acted like they were in the dark about the whole thing, and like they didn't know anything about this problem. When, you know, all the listeners and everything clearly did, you could tell it was like it was like night and day. But anyway, putting that aside, I thought to myself now, just leave the station and keep doing the show, but find a different provider. So I did, and at the beginning of the month, I sent them an email, and you know, it's one of those situations that's that's tough to make sometimes, tough to enact, because this was a station that I had been with for years. I'd been with them consistently for probably six years at this point. And before this, before even a few months ago, I had only good things to say uh, to them. And this was not a course of action that I ever expected to take. So, it just, it was tough to, to let them go and to send them that email saying, cancel everything. But in the end, you know, despite how things had been over the years, you gotta think, how are things presently? So, I powered through that, and I let them know. I said, look, you just gotta cancel it all, and that's gonna be that. So that's what happened, and I ended all broadcasts at this point via their station. So it's over with them. And I have moved broadcasts, to a station that I've been on simultaneously, but I've now made this other station the home for my broadcasts, where all my main broadcasts are going to be transmitted from, and I am pleased to say that the results of this change are outstanding. And I'm very thankful that I made this decision. So, at this point in time, I do two shows a week for listeners in North America, and one show a week for listeners in Europe. And even if it's not as many shows that I used to do, And even if I'm not on as many frequencies or times, etc., knowing that all of the broadcasts that I have now are reliable, 
that they're transmitted as intended and that they're going to be reaching an audience. And if you decide to listen, odds are you're actually going to be able to hear the show. I would rather that than having these broadcasts going out via something that most people can't hear. So I want to give you all a new broadcast schedule. I'm pleased to say that the new home for my show is with WWCR in Nashville, Tennessee. They have always done me good. They always have. They've never let me down. And I've been with them since 2018. So really four years at this point. God, how time flies. But they, they've they never let me down. And I know that everything goes out the way that they say it will. Like I said, they do a good job. They, you know, it's one of those things you get a good feeling about. And, and I'm very happy, again, with this decision that I've made because the listener feedback proves that it was the right decision. Because all of the listeners who struggled recently to hear the broadcast that I dropped have been tuning into this new series of airings and like I said the results are are outstanding they say wow this is even before a few months ago this is the signal is better than anything I could ever get on the other station Folks saying, wow, uh, the reception quality is excellent. The signal is extremely, extremely strong and clear. And I I have no problem hearing it. The other station, it would be a bit of a struggle to hear, etc. The signal would be weak. But this, this is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Very, very strong. And I get email after email about that. New listeners are tuning in again, which is great. People just kind of scanning around or picking up the signal. And the existing audience now has a station that, again, reliably carries it with a good signal. And pretty much everyone across the board is reporting major improvement. As a matter of fact, this might sound like a bold claim to make, but it's true. There hasn't been one single listener who reported the reception getting worse since I made this change. There has not been one single listener. And the amount of feedback has increased tenfold. And of everyone writing in, no one has, no one has said that. So I know that I made the right choice. And I'm happy with that. And so are the listeners. So without further ado... Let's get this new schedule down. I do two shows a week. They're kind of nighttime shows, but so far the times have been well received. And, and you know, let's just make the most of it. Um, if you want to listen in, you're welcome to. But here, here goes. Here are the broadcasts to North America. So the first show that I do, the frequency is 4840 kilohertz. That's 48 four zero kilohertz it airs at the time of 2 a.m eastern so this show is mostly better probably for west coast listeners but any night owls out there um listen in as well 2 a.m eastern every saturday morning that would be 1 a.m central saturday morning for listeners on the west coast that would be 11 p.m. Pacific, Friday evening. Again, on 48, 40 kilohertz. Now, you might say, well, that show's a little bit, uh, a little late. Is it repeated at all? Indeed, it is. There is a rebroadcast of that show on the frequency of 6115 kilohertz. That's 6115 kilohertz at 6 p.m. Eastern, every Saturday evening, that would be 5 p.m. Central, 
Saturday afternoon. Uh, this rebroadcast uh, gets the best signal uh, for listeners on the East Coast and in Central North America. So if you're in California, you might not get the best signal on that frequency. 4840 kilohertz does a great job to all of North America, all of the United States, all of Canada, Mexico, you name it. That frequency gets out. So that's just great for everyone. All of North America. The second show that I do, show number two, can be heard on 4840 kilohertz at the time of 12 a.m. Eastern, every Monday morning. Most people would think of that as Sunday evening. So that would be at 11 p.m. Central, Sunday evening, 10 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Pacific, every Sunday evening. 4840 kilohertz, 4840. So you can see that 4840 kilohertz is now my main frequency, and it is a darn good frequency at that. So, that's the one that reports those very reliable results and that major improvement. I do the broadcast to Europe as well. Of course, you're welcome to hear that on the frequency of 9670 kilohertz at the time of 7 p.m. Eastern European Summer Time every Friday evening. That's 6 p.m. Central European Summer Time, 5 p.m. British Summer Time every Friday evening, 9670 kilohertz, that's 9670. And the broadcast to Europe is absolutely outstanding as well. Gets a great signal out, to listeners all across Europe. Uh, Especially, though, it gets a great signal out to listeners in Russia and Ukraine. I hear from many listeners in Russia every week at this point, and uh, they seem to really like the show, which which is outstanding. And obviously, we know Russia is a huge, huge country, so the fact that the broadcast is able to really span the entirety of Russia is uh, outstanding. And likewise, that broadcast is also able to get a signal out in areas that I'm not even really targeting. So, it definitely gets heard across the Middle East. So anywhere from Syria to Afghanistan... Listeners there can hear that broadcast as well, clearly. It reaches South Asia, so it'll get to India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. It reaches Central Asia, all of the stands, uh, especially Kazakhstan, gets a very strong signal there. It reaches East Asia, I hear every week from listeners in Japan who tune in. And surprisingly, it gets, it must get a pretty good signal out to listeners in Southeast Asia, too, uh, because I've been getting more and more pieces of feedback from listeners there. So people will write in from Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. I'll hear from listeners in Australia. And even more surprising, if you're in South America, may as well try to tune in from there as well, because I hear from listeners in South America too. So that broadcast is above and beyond. Mind you, this is a broadcast targeting Eastern Europe, and it reaches all of these areas in addition to that. So it's like I'm getting a broadcast to the Middle East and Asia along with this broadcast to Europe. So, very happy with that. It's truly a worldwide broadcast and it gets to, to many listeners there. So, that's great to see. 
these broadcasts, you know, they definitely, they have their pros and they have their cons, right? Obviously, like in terms of the drawbacks, obviously there was that whole issue with the other station that it was causing those reception issues. But that was able to get fixed, you know? That was eventually able to uh, to be resolved. And that was good. The other thing is obviously shortwave radio. It's, it's not, at least in some parts of the world, it's not the most well-known medium anymore. And on a global scale, it's, it's certainly in decline. Now, it's nice that the broadcasts to Europe is able to reach parts of the world where shortwave is still listened to. And it's cool to think that just knowing that the broadcast is able to be picked up on a radio, even in places like Afghanistan, that if... And I guarantee it's probably happened. I'll never know for sure, but just by the odds... Given that the shortwave listenership in Afghanistan is still relatively high, there's still probably millions of people in that country that own radios capable of receiving shortwave, and there's definitely a uh, a decent percentage who still listen to the international broadcasts over there. That just knowing that you might have someone in some rural village in Afghanistan you know, kind of winding down for the night, and they're kind of scanning around on their radio, and they pick up my show. And maybe they don't even listen in. Like I said, I'll never know, but such an outcome is possible, and that's cool to think. So even if the medium is in decline, which it obviously is, I'm just trying to make the most of, you know, what you might consider its last days. And I'm just trying to like I said, make the most of it, provide something for the remaining listeners to enjoy, and and get the most of it from a broadcasting perspective. Reach who still can be reached, whoever's out there listening in. And it's just fun to hear from people all over the world tuning in. And, and it's great. It, it really is. Radio, it's still a medium that I still believe in it, and I still think that it's something that has potential. I think it's still something that a lot of people overlook and don't really think about until they need to think about it. And in those cases, there's usually... Radio is a good fallback, by that I mean. So in times of war, like you see with Ukraine... uh, when everything else goes down, that's the thing that's still there. In times of natural disaster, very severe natural disasters like hurricanes, major earthquakes, tsunamis, etc., radio is the one thing that still pulls through and will still be there. You know, overcoming censorship, that's another thing. That you'll hear things as they're presented. And it's still a good medium, in my opinion anyway, for getting different viewpoints and trying to think critically. So there's, there's still, it's still got some stuff to it. And the shortwave I especially like because you can hear all sorts of broadcasts. You'll hear international stations. You'll hear plenty of world music. You'll hear programs news, talk, cultural programs from places that you pretty much never hear of. Otherwise, you'll get different perspectives from different countries on things going on, and and it's just a cool medium in that regard. You've got stations where anyone can buy the airtime, so anyone who wants to foot the bill can get on the air, and you'll hear some very eclectic programs. And like I said, you'll just, you'll, you'll hear a little bit of everything. Uh, It is a medium, like I said, in decline. There's less and less to listen to each year, but it still has some of that 
magic to it. So given that I feel comfortable and confident at this point after a, a time of turbidity, given that I feel comfortable and confident about the state of my broadcasts to North America at this point, given that I feel like like they'll be able to, to be with this station indefinitely, but really as long as I do the show for, and that as a listener you'll be able to pick them up, I am going to go back to recommending radios to listeners in North America. I said I was going to stop doing that in the last show, and it was because I didn't feel confident at that point in time, not having changed stations yet, I didn't feel confident, like, if you got a radio, you would be able to hear the show. At this point, I do, because the results and the improvement that I've seen, I think, proves that to me. So, if you do want to get a radio to listen to the broadcast on, in North America, if you're in Europe and you'd like to get a radio, if you're in the Middle East, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and you'd like to get a radio, just shoot me an email. If you'd like to know more about radio in general, I'd be happy to send you some information, but just reach out to me. V O R W I N F O at gmail.com And I guess on the final note, you know, one thing that I touched upon a little bit is the listening audience. The broadcast, one thing that it could sometimes be a double-edged sword, admittedly, and I think this really goes for every... You know, it's not just a radio thing. And those of you who also create content on any platform that gets out to people, right? It could be anything. It could be radio, podcast, could be posts on any social media site, could do videos, music, etc. But if it gets out to a number of people, then you know that no matter what you do, you're going to reach some good people and some bad people. And that's just the luck of the draw. And and that's the piece of advice that I'll give to anyone who's even considering any sort of aspect of if you want to create any sort of content. Understand that if you do reach people, you can't control who you reach. So just be ready for that. And understand that you're going to reach some wonderful people and you're going to reach some horrible people. And just be ready for all sorts of reactions. It might be tough, but just be ready for that, because it will happen. Uh, wonderful reactions, bad reactions, disgusting, etc. It's like on the YouTube, uh, for the most part, you have to deal with the trolls and people who are just very insulting, etc. But, you know, you just ignore them. You just ignore them, and and you don't give them the time of day. And it's it's gotten to a point where I've kind of seen everything that's that one could say negatively about me. And, you know, it's just, I, I ignore it. And that approach works just fine. So, that works fine on the YouTube. On the radio, by and large, the radio audience is wonderful. And they're, they're such a wonderful group of folks. I, and I mean that sincerely. They really are. It's one of the reasons why I look forward time and again to getting to the microphone and a reason why I wanted to keep that show going and make that change to get a better signal out. It wasn't something that I'm willing to give up on. But even then, you know, you still, you know, you, let me tell you, you get some real crazies out there with the radio stuff and like this some of these people are disgusting though they really are 
Like, I mean, there there was this one, this old pedophile that would sit there and think that there were, there were coded messages or something in the music that gets played on the broadcast, you know? You, these people, they're ridiculous. And quite frankly, people like that should be taken out of society. They're, they ser- They serve no purpose, no good purpose whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned. But what can you do? You just ignore them. You block them, and you ignore them. Because th- that's all you can do. I remember there was this one guy who thought for some reason that I was I was being paid off by the FBI or something. It's very accusatory, mind you, but it was just that was just bizarre. Not so much disgusting. But you know, the good thing at least is that people like that only seem to appear infrequently at best, which is good. Which is good because by and large, yeah, you get a few crazies like that every now and then, but by and large, the audience that you reach through radio, it's just very, very rewarding because you reach a wonderful group of people, again, all over the world, and you just see some great folks. So by and large, again, the audience the broadcasts go out to, it's great. And one of the main reasons it gives me the motivation to keep coming back to the microphone. I don't get paid to do that broadcast. I pay for every hour of airtime that the broadcast goes out at. And the airtime these days isn't cheap. But number one, at least I know that in terms of the signal strength, at least I'm getting what I pay for in that regard. But most importantly, in my opinion, I think that it's money well spent. And seeing the feedback that comes in, seeing the reach that the broadcast has, it gives me the motivation not only to to make sure all the bills get paid and everything, and make sure I am able to budget things accordingly, but also I've been having some energy problems lately, just personally. It's, you know, that's just my own health issue. And... It gives me the motivation to power through that and say, all right, no matter what, I want to get to the microphone three times a week to do these shows because it's something I really look forward to. So some good news there. The show goes on, and I'm pleased to say that I'd say this is, I mean, I wish that that original issue with the former station could have worked itself out, but it couldn't. So this is the next best course of action. I'm very happy with uh, the the direction it all took. If you, by the way, would like uh, that radio schedule in writing, then you could real easily consult it and all the different times and all of that. Again, feel free to write out, (laughs) write out, reach out, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Now for the remainder of the broadcast, I want to take things in a different direction. Let's go over to the mailbag. The way this program works is very simple, very self-explanatory. I open up my email, and I read whatever listener emails come in. It's literally as straightforward as that. There's no catch. That's all that there is to it. And it's a lot of fun because, like I said, the diversity in topics uh, discussed is amazing. And it's a lot of fun, too. You never know what you're going to get. And I would hope, at least from a listener perspective, it's fun as well, because it's a way you can directly participate. It's a way you can reach out to me. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me about anything, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, are there any topic suggestions? Is there anything that you would just like to hear my thoughts on? You're welcome to... uh, ask about that as well, bring up a topic you'd like to hear me cover. If there is something that you would like to share, be that an anecdote, an experience, some thoughts, whatever it might be, you're welcome to do that as well. And again, there's a blank slate, and I think that's the best part of it. 
anyone is welcome to write in. And if you're still not not sure about uh, what should I ask, what should I talk about, how would this really work, then just listen in. Listen to some of the emails that come in. I hope that can kind of give you a little bit of of an idea of how it all goes. And then just go from there. But all are welcome to write in. And I'll certainly, though I cannot, of course, give any guarantee, just purely because of the volume of emails that come in, certainly try my best to then read and respond to your email right here on the air in the next show that I do. And like I said, though I, though I can't guarantee a response, I certainly try to the best of my ability, and as you can see in recent shows, I've been here at the microphone for a good four or five hours getting to emails, so I certainly try to the best of my ability to uh, respond to whatever I can. All right, all this talk about emails aside, way to reach me, very simple, again via email, this is the same address that I've repeated for everything else, so it's just a one, a one-stop shop essentially. Way to reach me is simple: v o r w i n f o at gmail dot com. Once more, that's v o r w i n f o at gmail.com. That said, let's get into it. Let's open up the mailbag and see what's in store for us tonight. Our first email comes in from Matt, who writes, My name is Matt, but people call me DeGaldi. I've been watching your videos since 2013 or so. I've seen all of the hate and love from many. I even made fun of you the first time. But as I got older, I kept watching your videos and realized you are one kind gentleman, and I look forward to your videos now. In fact, for the last two years, I'm always waiting for your next video. I enjoy the reviews. I've recently gotten into your podcast, and I love it. You can shout me out, if you'd like, in a future episode. Two questions. What devices do I need to listen to shortwave radio? My other question, would you be interested in going on the H3 podcast and doing a little collab? They would freaking love you. That's all I have until next time. Thank you, Matt writing in. Uh, so your first question in regards to uh, wanting to listen to shortwave radio, I don't say this to simply, you know, to try to, um, I'm just trying to say don't feel as though I am being condescending or uh, uh, overly redundant or any of that in my answer. Uh, this is just the truth. All you need is a radio that's capable of picking up shortwave broadcasts. And you could find more information about that in the description of this podcast. But it's very simple. It's just a, a portable radio. It comes with an antenna. Although if you'd like to pick up more stations, then you might need a wire antenna. Um, but a lot of this stuff, it, it's pretty straightforward. But all you would need is a radio that is capable of receiving uh, shortwave broadcasts. Now, it should be noted, though, that the medium is in decline. So be aware of what you're getting into before you make any move in terms of wanting to get a radio. Uh, just be aware that the amount of things worth listening to is diminishing by the year. So please bear that in mind. Now, you can look at it then that maybe it's not worth it. Or B, uh, you can look at it as I'm going to enjoy what good is left before it's all gone. So just bear that in mind. Now, as for the H3 podcast and any sort of collaboration therewith, 
Thank you for your suggestion. Uh, these days I don't really do collaborations, just merely out of my uh, personal preference. But uh, thank you, though, for the suggestion. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, when I mention that, for some reason they see that as some sort of... Uh, some sort of... Oh, you think you're better than everyone else because you're you 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 don't doing you're not doing collaborations, but I can assure you uh, any sort of notion in that regard has nothing to do with any of that. And it's merely because I'm extremely introverted and I just enjoy doing things uh, with this broadcast and with the channel myself. But it is of no by no means anything that, oh, I'm, I think I'm better than these people, I don't want to work with them because they're beneath me, etc. Uh, so I just hope no one gets that sort of impression from that, as, as I know, unfortunately, some folks uh, do when they hear these sorts of things. Thank you for writing. Margot writes, I am an employee at Wingstop, and heard a rumor from my general manager that a chicken sandwich might come out soon. Just wanted to let you know so you can keep an eye out if you would like to review this item for your main channel. Thank you, Margo. It's certainly good to know of things that might be on the horizon to review. It's been a slow time at the moment, I have been doing a lot of chicken sandwiches, but certainly if they release one, I will review it, because at the very least, I have discovered that there's always a baseline demand for chicken sandwiches. They're just iconic at this point, and they're kind of ingrained into society, um, per se, and there's always going to be that level of demand just solely because it is a chicken sandwich. So, thank you for that suggestion. Josh, who writes as follows. I've been enjoying the latest podcast immensely. My question for you is a rather existential one. In your view, what is the likelihood that the United States, or perhaps even the world as a whole, could experience total societal collapse within our lifetime. I am pessimistic and expect the worst to happen, though nothing as extreme as extinction. I think the world was not ready for, and has not had enough time, to be this interconnected thanks to the internet. David Bowie in the 90s compared the World Wide Web to an alien life form and commented on how unpredictable and immensely profound it would be to the future. I think as far as the internet is concerned, we have no idea what we're dealing with and the consequences of being this intimately in touch with other humans across the globe. It's going to be dire. Just wanted to get your thoughts on where society's headed and the reasons for it. Cheers, wishing you the best. Thank you, Josh. So, there's something that I saw that I'll, uh, I'll read. I'll get it up in a minute. It's going to take a minute to find this. So I'll share some other thoughts while this other thing's loading. And it was from a few years ago. Whether people agree or disagree, I think it's worth looking at anyway. And I would say at the very least, um, you, could, you could notice some similarities. Now, whether the whole thing is true or not, you obviously won't know till it really happens, but it's uh, one of those things that makes you go, hmm, you know, it just, it, not necessarily that it'll prove anything, but it just makes you stop for a minute. Now, anyway, the way I see it, I don't see total societal collapse uh, occurring in either of these places, be that the U.S. or uh, the world happening, I, I don't see it happening to that extent within our lifetime, unless something absolutely dire and completely unforeseen were to happen, 
Um, now, by unforeseen, I mean something that we might understand could happen, but was not expected to, such as, let's say if Yellowstone exploded tomorrow, then it will result, at least in the United States, in parts of the country for total societal collapse, absolutely, um, because it will be such a drastic and extreme situation that order will not exist in certain regions. Uh, there will be other parts of the country that will survive that, but will be pushed to the absolute limit in terms of what they will be able to take. So order may still exist there, but, you know, it's going to... Uh, things are going to get pushed as far as they can if something like that happens. Or if as I've referenced previously in this broadcast, uh, let's say the theorized La Palma uh, mega tsunami were to ever happen, right? The eastern seaboard would be destroyed in those affected areas. Again, you would see a total societal collapse um, for a while. Even under certain circumstances, you see this in other areas too. Um, where order will temporarily cease to exist for the time being. It's like, you'll always hear about when there's going to be a major hurricane hitting certain places, and things get all evacuated, etc., um, either right before or right after the storm hits, uh, sometimes you hear about reports of looting, and it's because in the immediate aftermath or preceding that event, and by this I should stress, we're not talking about people looting basic necessities because they're dying or anything. It's people are exploiting a situation where they know the response is likely going to be limited, if not non-existent, so we can get away with it. And um, that's just human, human nature, at least for some individuals. So there are those situations where it will happen for a short period of time, but on a full level like that, nationwide or worldwide, I don't see that. Um, I think some world powers may fall, perhaps like the United States, and others, and I'm kind of thinking of China here, will uh, kind of rise up. And I think that's, you know, the dynamic is kind of shifting in that regard. That's the way I see it. I think the U.S. is on the way down. Um, is China in some ways going to be on the uh, way up? I mean, certainly you talk about how things have changed over decades. Absolutely. Uh, maybe the global dynamic is just uh, changing. And certain countries are going to be brought up while others are brought down. And maybe they already have like a pecking order and it's all just going to be uh, this certain way, and uh, and that's just how it is. I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe it's just the way civilization is, you know? Certain uh, countries and empires rise up, and then they fall. So maybe it's just the cycle of things, and it's just the way uh, that it is. Who's to say? But I don't see things falling apart to that extent in the U.S. Now, do I think the quality of life, the way people are, etc., is going to get worse and worse? I do. But I just don't think it's going to be um, complete collapse. So that's my prediction of worldwide as well. Unless, like I said, there's one of those unforeseen catalysts. Now, in terms of your thoughts on the internet, I agree. Um, I think it has, and <laughs> I understand that some will immediately see the irony in what I am about to say, and that's fine. You're welcome to see that. I think social media at this point, I think the internet in and of itself is a concept, of course, and I'm sure we would all agree is a brilliant idea. And if it were used, let's say, as a responsible, encyclopedic resource, 
where people could access information and even entertainment in in some ways um, in a responsible and mature manner for the betterment of humanity, I think you would see immediately uh, what a marvelous resource the internet is. But when you see something that has, has, I want to say had, but I mean, could it be, you know, certainly could get better, but do I I see that happening? No. That had so much potential uh, get exploited and squandered through especially social media and smartphones. Those two things go hand in hand. I think that's one reason um, for the societal decline we are seeing. And I think social media sites, the algorithms that they have, the trends, the ideals, and the behaviors that they perpetuate, be that because they're told to, um, or if it's purely just because of profit, because they know that these trends, if we promote it, it'll make us money, it'll get interest, attention, etc. They want to they want to make sure young people are addicted to this stuff. Um, social media, I'm sure we've all heard, social media addiction, smartphone addiction, internet addiction, etc. Uh, those, I think, are very real things. But that's that's what they want, right? That's that's how they uh, they want it to be. But I see social media, especially. The internet in and of itself, it just got really bad, especially when social media really came into play. And what ties it all together especially is smartphones, because it didn't make it any more an activity that you would have to sit at the computer to do have to sit at your laptop to do. Now you can be anywhere. You can be in bed. You can be on your sofa. You can be sitting outside. You could be going for a walk. You could be behind the wheel of your car, unfortunately. A lot of people do that. We know it. We won't pretend that that isn't the case. Uh, You can be anywhere, any place, and as long as you have the connection, then you can access this. But, you know, I just hate what it's done. I really do. And like I said, I expect everyone to kind of smirk at the irony of what I'm saying. What is it that I do for a living, right? I make videos on a social media site for a mass audience utilizing these very algorithms that I'm just criticizing. And like I said earlier, it pays the bills, I get it. And I understand the irony completely. But you know, if I think about it, if I could have a world where, let's say I would never, you know, if YouTube and stuff didn't exist, but it would mean that this world would be a better place. Of course I would take that. You know, what I do here, it's just what I do. So, absolutely. But, um... I just I just hate what it's done. In so many ways. Don't even get... I've been thinking about this a lot. And I could go on, I could talk for hours about this stuff. I don't even know where to begin, quite frankly. Maybe maybe I shouldn't. I understand. Here's what I'll say. If (laughs) the people, I doubt it, but if they're listening in from these sites, and now they want to punish me, you know, in the algorithm for saying these things, I get why it is this way. And I understand it. And you should also know damn well that I'm not going to do anything about it. Just explaining my grievances. People might kind of find the fact that... But I do think that these algorithms, you know, 
Sometimes they have a mind of their own, and other times someone can、uh, can adjust them, can kind of tweak them to do certain things. Anyway, enough of that. These are so many things that I don't like. Like I said, these are things that could have been. I don't know. So much good could have came from it, and instead, I just feel like so much of this degradation that we're seeing. One of not the sole contributing contributing factor, but one of the major contributing factors has been social media. The things that it glorifies, the things that it promotes by and large, especially、um, with the youngest generations. So we're talking, unfortunately, the way it is at this point from birth. Because I feel like you've got people who are going to shove a phone or something、um, in the face of their newborn, and as soon as the person is coherent enough to hold an object, they're going to give them a phone. And you know, I remember there was a time where I used to think that having a、uh, you know ten, eleven year old on social media, I used to be shocked by that. You know, a couple years ago, I would be surprised by that. But at this point, I hear about people putting their four-year-old and five-year-old on social media sites and putting them at the mercy of you know these sorts of algorithms to feed them content. And I get that it's easy, but I don't think that's the right thing to do. And I, I am hard line with that. I'm hard line with everything that I'm saying here.、Uh, these views are completely inflexible because I've seen what I've seen, and I I cannot, in any way, feel differently. And、uh, it just doesn't seem right to me. I don't think. I don't think that this.、Uh, the social media culture. Like I said, the things that get promoted through these algorithms, a lot of the very prevalent content that we see, the narcissism that it absolutely breeds and promotes,、uh, the corresponding then ideals that it promotes, and the concepts it gets into the minds of. What I would consider to be generally impressionable young people, especially children and young teens, and on and on and on it goes. Extreme narcissism, radicalism, extreme degeneracy—the fact that so many awful behaviors that are only going to contribute more to. A degradation of society, in some ways, are idealized, and at the very least, even if you don't have people lauding these things, sometimes you have awful behaviors that still get views, and you have a whole generation of people that are almost brainwashed in a sense to look at these things and think attention is good, because that's what social media will. Kind of get into people's heads. Any attention is good. Views are good. You know, I want to be a famous、uh, TikTok star. I want to be a famous this, a famous that, etc. And people will now see that. Well, if I do this, if I treat someone deplorably, if I go and、uh, well, these videos of people verbally abusing. Uh, let's say they're teachers or someone who works here or does that. Or if I go and、um, scare all these people and pretend that there's、uh, this or that or whatever,、um, it could be little things like that that、um, make everything worse.、It、could be something more serious like、um, actually attacking someone or promoting some sort of trend or challenge that will negatively harm. Uh, individuals or their surrounding environment, but they see it gets the views. People are at this point they're conditioned to assume that's good. I want that, so then I'm going to do it if it means that I've got a chance of getting views. 
So whether these people even consciously know what they're doing or they're just trying to get that attention that they've been programmed to crave, it doesn't lead to anything good. And every now and then you'll see a few things that are kind of outliers for great... And, 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 and you know, that's good to see. But like I said, it doesn't cancel out everything else that it's done. So, and I could keep going on and on about this stuff. It just is what it is. Um, but when I see what's going on, what things are at at this point, and where I think that they're headed, as much as I'd like to not see that, there's a reason why I'm kind of despondent when I look uh, at the future, because it seems impossible any other way. And, um... If it changes that drastically, I'd almost assume that it would be um, the result of some sort of, you know, higher power or, or magic genie or something that intervened and uh, changed the course of things. Because it seems like it's not going to be any other way. You know, the more I look at, let's say, these increases in mass shootings, do you think that has correlation? Um... I'd say it seems likely. I'll tell you that. And that's just one example of many. It's all going downhill, folks. That's the way I see it. And uh, I, I just, I can't, uh, I can't see it any other way. So, in the end, that doesn't mean just throw in the towel and give up, because if we do that, then we're kind of contributing to that, aren't we? I just kind of despondently accept that, look, this is what it is, but I'm still, despite this, uh, going to live my life as I do and try to be the best I can be, which is far from perfect, but I say, even if I kind of feel despondent about this, I don't think that's an excuse to give up and throw in the towel and just say, all right. I guess if you can't beat him, join him, because it's just not in my nature, and I just want to uh, try to keep my head up, and despite everything I see around me, um, still try to abide by the attitude, uh, treat others how you want to be treated, but I'll tack on a little something at the end of that. Treat others the way you want to be treated, but stand up for yourself, too. If everyone treated each other in this world with respect and dignity, then that last part wouldn't need to be tacked on, because it would be a given, and it would, you know, it's just how it would be. But when you've got so many people that are very self-centered and are eager to screw everyone else over and treat each other horribly and do horrible things then you have to have your guard up these days. It's not just, maybe I should, you need to. Because otherwise, if your metaphorical shields are down, uh, people are going to get you. They're going to exploit that, and you will be hurt. Uh, be that physically, or mentally, emotionally, or all of the above, because this world is littered with uh, awful people. And that's not to say necessarily um, assume that everyone out there is a bad person, but watch your back and be very, very careful with who you trust. So just be careful, um, because there's lots of people out there in this world who are, who are bad, uh, who will do bad things. There are people out there, you know, who are just misguided. They're on the wrong track. Um, they're just, a, unfortunately, a product of their environment and a product of this society. And, you know, they're kind of with the wrong crowd, etc. And theoretically, could they be a better person? Um, of course they could. But are there people out there who are just plain evil? and will never change and will use every opportunity they've got to better themselves while screwing, or at the expense, I should say, of everyone else, um, screwing everyone over, I, I, that's what I wanted to say, 
kind of combine the two, yes, uh, of course there are. So be mindful of that. And also be aware that there's folks out there, a lot, sadly, especially because I think some of these traits, again, uh, increasingly today are glorified, uh, whether people realize it or not. Psychopathy is a very real thing. And there are people out there who will pretend to be good and who will pretend to be this, that, and the other thing. Is that how they really are? They'll make you think that. But be careful. These people, they're, they're, <laughs> they're pretty good at what they do. But there will be red flags. They're not perfect, usually. But that's why I say, be extremely careful with who you trust. As for the internet, at present we don't we at present we don't deserve what um what we've had bestowed unto us. That's how I feel. I don't think we deserve this. I don't think the world right now is ready for it. But despite those things, we've got it anyway. And, uh, and this is what we have. Maybe if the internet were even just invented a few decades before, and um, things might be different. But it came to be when it when it did, and uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can't change the past. So that's what we. Uh, we have in that regard. I will say, interestingly, you know, I understand that these views for some might seem a bit harsh, they might seem a bit extreme, and they might not be uh, necessarily agreeable to everyone, uh, nor do I expect them to, you know? I'm just here at the microphone to talk. I'm not here to uh, try to convince anyone of uh, anything other than, you know, what you believe and how you feel. And uh, like I said, I know that social media isn't all bad. I just think that it's, um, I, you know, I just, I, I see it how I see it, I guess. But I know that there's good things that kind of come along with it, too. You know, you get the good and the bad. I guess I just feel that one outweighs the other, and it's just the way I feel about it. Um, but anyway... I, I've I've come to feel this way not off of just because it's how I feel. I do a lot of research about this stuff, and I'll watch certain things that I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have the time to, but um, I watch certain things, and it helps me understand if how I feel um, kind of represents the truth, in my eyes anyway, how I, let's say, just honestly feel, or if there are certain other viewpoints that I ought to consider and perhaps even adopt if I realize that maybe I got certain things wrong. And I will admit, um, it's actually through that process why I've come to adopt the, the view that I have now. Um, by looking at various things, by asking myself, how about this, you know, how about that? Have you considered, etc., etc.? And I'll stop and think for a minute. Sometimes I'll think, yes, it actually furthers what I've felt. And other times I'll think, no, you know, I haven't thought about that, but that makes sense, and it's uh, essentially irrefutable. So maybe I ought to uh, take that into account. You know, so it's a blend of all of these sorts of things. And... I'll watch many examples of, yeah, the good in society, because there still are good folks out there. Um, but I also like watching examples, uh, let's say, in the legal system of bad people in society, and if certain things such as, let's say, rehabilitation are even possible. And uh, I think that's just a person-by-person -person thing. For instance, one thing I like watching is um, legal proceedings. And by that, I don't even mean just like, you know, the generic um, crime dramas and stuff. Yeah, I'll watch that stuff too. That's no problem. 
um, the true crime stuff, you know, or even like a court TV. I'll watch that stuff. Um, but I like the raw, the, the more uh, raw and authentic things as well. So, of course, you know, I'll watch various police videos, right? And sometimes that's just for entertainment, like uh, the police chases, that sort of stuff can be really something else. But I also like these sort of uh, slice of life type videos. Um, be that people just kind of walking around doing their thing, showing various areas. Or again, in terms of the, you know, legal system, uh, police and uh, even courts and stuff, just going about their business, doing what they do every day, seeing a wide variety of people, uh, their nature, how they react and respond to things, how they are, etc. And it helps me formulate these, uh, these views. So sometimes I'll watch just various um, court cases. I will watch first appearance hearings where people, after they've committed their crimes, will be brought before the judge. And uh, again, you know, their case will kind of get worked on. And uh, you can kind of see how some folks are in that regard. Uh, Recently, I came across something that was even more interesting from uh, the state of Louisiana where you can uh, watch the parole process and watch some of these prisoners uh, go before the parole board and ask for that chance. And let me tell you, I've watched this for a bit now, and I've watched... I don't know, maybe combined, you know, 20 to 24 hours of this sort of uh, interview footage. And it didn't change, it reaffirmed, I guess, everything that I kind of thought. That you've got all of these people that do various things. And I've seen people there in front of the parole board. Mind you, these are people who, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part are hardcore criminals. Uh, serving some serious prison time. And I've seen everything so far anyway from, yeah, are there a few low-level drug offenders mixed in here and there? Yeah. But you will see people in there for um, serious things. First-degree murder. You'll have uh, rapists there, pedophiles, uh, child abusers... You'll have people there that have just done financial crimes, people there who have done aggravated um, robbery, uh, drug trafficking, drug dealing, possession, etc. And uh, it goes on and on. You'll see some of these people try to bring their case to the board. And a percentage of these folks, it's not the biggest percentage though, maybe 10%, you might say, have actually been uh, somewhat, I won't even say fully, somewhat rehabilitated by what they've experienced in prison through some of the programs that they have access to, etc., and genuinely atone for their crimes. And a lot of those folks who maybe did realize the error of their ways and um, actually turned things around do get released. And it shows that their genuine efforts to better themselves do have positive uh, repercussions, positive impacts. But you've got plenty of people who either have learned absolutely nothing from their time in prison or are clearly no better an individual as uh, when they entered... So at the very least, I see a lot of people that anyway, if if I were on that board, I would vote without a doubt to deny, or I wish sometimes, I've seen some of these people, that you almost wish that they could, I don't know if retroactively is the word, um, almost retroactively adjust the prisoner's sentence and make it harsher than it actually is. There's some people that I almost wish, I know people will say what they want about this, and that's fine, that I almost wish that this board had the power 
to adjust the person's sentence and just give him a uh, give him a death sentence at this point and just uh, do away with them. Um, because not only did some of these folks learn absolutely nothing, but they make it abundantly clear uh, what a horrible person they are. So you see, a, you see a lot of craziness. You see a lot of people, and uh, you, there's people who it could almost be heartwarming in a way, where um, you see what good some of these programs actually did, and that they really, they came to their senses and realized that they messed up. But you had other people who either learned nothing, didn't improve a bit, got worse, don't care. Um, but the worst, and I've seen two that are this way so far, uh, they'll sit there and they'll try to manipulate the board into thinking that they've actually reformed as a person from their time served be that five years, ten years, fifteen years behind bars. But then when you take into account other circumstances, not solely their testimony, or not solely what the guy's mother says, you know, or his, you know, his family vouching for him and say he was always a, such a good boy, etc. But when you actually hear what other folks have to say, be that the legal community, uh, the victims, or what the assessment of the individual's behavior in prison was, uh, how many infractions they got, etc. You could tell that they're just, they're good storytellers, and they're trying to get one over on the board. There was this one guy, I remember, very well articulated, um, was doing all sorts of programs in the prison, etc., but what was he sitting in prison for? Um, not to get graphic or anything, but it was um, a series of sexual crimes with his daughter, who uh, wasn't even a teenager. And it was over a period of years. And without that sort of knowledge, you know, the guy makes himself seem competent and that he did wrong, but he's trying to fix everything around. Number one, though, when I look at the severity of his transgressions, immediately, if I were in charge of things, he wouldn't even have a shot at um, any sort of parole whatsoever. But... One thing that the board called him out for, and this was good because otherwise it looked like he was right on the path to approval and getting out of prison. But they, um, number one, they asked him about the why. Um, why'd you do this horrible thing? And like I said, he had an answer for everything. He was well articulated. He was saying, well, I was going through a lot of pain after an injury, and I was on opioids, and um, it was making me do these things. Now, the thing about that, though, is number one, normal people who get into an accident and even are on opioids uh, don't magically turn into pedophiles and do these things. But number two, as I soon realized, he was refusing to blame himself. That's the first thing. Never once did he say that he was the problem. It was always something else. It was my accident. It was the opioids. Um, he never once said that I was the problem. Like I said, I think things like this are unforgivable, period. Um, but if we humor this... So he never, he never took that responsibility. And also, despite how he was coming off, he was still being misleading to the board. He was making it, he was trying to give the impression that his daughter was older and it was just a really short thing while he was going through this opioid situation for just a few months 
and that he couldn't live with himself, so he turned himself in, etc. That was his story, and he was banking that the board wouldn't know the details of his case. Well, it turns out, he was on opioids for a few months, yes. All of this took place over years, regularly. And he started doing this before he ever got in that accident or ever got on um, opioids. And he never turned himself in. His daughter went to the police and agreed to wear a wire in order to get the sufficient evidence from him. So, one guy on the board, there were three people, one guy fell for the story and voted to grant the guy his parole, get this guy back in society. Um, but the two other people on the board didn't, they saw right through that. And one guy said, you know, you didn't know this, but last night I read your case three times over and I already knew all of the answers to every question that I was asking you about regarding the details. And you're a bright guy, but you haven't been honest with yourself, and you especially haven't been honest with this board. And because of those things, the first start of the first step of rehabilitation is coming to terms with what you did, accepting the blame and responsibility, the consequences of your actions. And you've clearly done none of those things. So it doesn't matter what you've done in your time in prison, you haven't learned from this at all. You most certainly aren't rehabilitated, so I'm going to deny you. And two of the board members did, and, um, and that was that. Now, those sorts of things I think are good to see, and not the person's actions, but the fact that there's still people, at least, that see through this stuff. And that's like a relief to see. Um, but these boards don't always make the right decisions. Um, are there some people that I think should have been released who weren't? Yes. Are there people who were released that I don't think should have been? Absolutely. Um, you know, there was one guy who was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. And I, it just... um. It baffles me that they would let someone like that out in the amount of time that they did. And that just, um, I just would have felt the guy needed at the very least more time. But anyway, look who's talking about this stuff. Someone who isn't an expert in this. I guess I'm in just an armchair commentator. But sometimes, you know, I agree with the decisions. Sometimes I don't. Elijah writes, I have a couple questions this week. Have you ever thought of making music? Are you musically talented? I ask this because if you were to make an album of some sort, I would be excited to listen. And if you were to make an album, what genre would you go for? Second question, do you plan on making any more lecture type videos? I really enjoy that type of content. So thank you, Elijah. No, I am not musically talented in that regard, so no album releases would ever be forthcoming from me simply because I haven't the ability to create one or create anything that could be considered remotely listenable so I can't really answer it because there isn't any sort of answer that really could be given in that case. So, no, I'm just... A, I'm a music listener, not a creator thereof. Again, I just... I don't have the ability to do it, and I, I admit that. Lecture-type videos, I'd be happy to do more of those, but I think... I think I've realized at this point with the channel... I might have to make another channel to really do this sort of stuff or expand the VORW channel. 
I just don't think that sort of appeal really exists with the main channel, the report of the week. And I think that channel should just be a place for reviews and kind of lighthearted videos, not necessarily serious lectures. Now, that isn't to say that I wouldn't post some on that channel, perhaps, but I think largely I would have to find a better place to distribute them because I just don't see the appeal to many of the viewers. So that's why I think an alternate channel would be best suited for that. So thank you for your question, a good question there. We have a question, really just an email. From Sarah, who writes, Would you do a radio show on a major network, like the BBC, or even television, if someone made you a serious offer? Let's imagine the utopian situation that they'd say, Here, you have 30 minutes around 10 p.m. Do with it what you want. Would you give it a go? I laid in bed last night and thought a lot about it. I wonder if you would like it or if it would be too stressful. I myself could never do such a thing, but I'd also die a thousand times inside if I had to speak in front of your YouTube or radio audience. So thank you, Sarah, for your question. I'd say it would depend on the circumstances. Uh, it would all depend on the circumstances and how it could be done. It's not, it's not something that I would reject offhand. It would really come down to creative control. I would go with the radio side of things, definitely. Not television, because I just think of how I'm doing and what, what is best for me. And I would say that, let's say, getting in front of a microphone, doing that, I'd be better off with that at this point. And, uh... I can... I, I, like I said, it depends on the circumstances. If I were certain that I were given the creative control, and I could legitimately do with it as I please, and I'm not under let's say, the control or influence from producers or people higher up who have agendas or sponsors or advertisers or even pop culture trends, I'd probably do it, at least for a bit, test the waters, see how I like it, see how it goes over. And if it's something that I could do my way and... Uh, do it in the way that I'm comfortable, I could give it a shot, I think. Um, but obviously, if it would have to be in strict adherence to certain policies, again, I might not have a... It would depend on the circumstances, but it's certainly not something upon which I would have any overt rejection toward. I'd say, all right, it would depend on the offer, but I wouldn't necessarily be completely against it. Because, again... I'm already used to reaching a mass audience, and it's it's still weird to me. But I'm used to it at this point. So I know I could do it. Because already, it's like, it's crazy to think, all right, the review I did for Little Caesars Pepperoni Pizza at the time of recording this, has reached over 250,000 people. I mean, I can't even imagine that. 250,000 people. And most videos, on average, at a minimum, will, will reach about 175,000 people or more. I can't imagine that many people, yet they, they get out to that many. 
I just can't, I can't believe it yet. That's a regular thing. So I already do reach many viewers and listeners around the world, but it's still crazy to me. It never won't be, you know? It never won't be. Good question. Oh, this is a stupid spam email. Let's get rid of that one. Sometimes I get these spam emails with rather generic titles, and then I forget whether or not it's for the show until I click on it, and then I realize, oh, no, this is just nonsense. Luke checks in. In Brisbane, Australia. Regular listener for the last three or four years. I originally found you on YouTube through Boogie2988, who did a parody video uh, dressing up in a shirt and tie, making a Mick Whopper to review. Yeah, I remember that. That's going back to 2015. I remember he, uh, he did that years back. And uh, you have two questions. Question one. Do you see fossil fuels being outlawed in Western societies in our lifetime in favor of green energy? What are your thoughts, positive or negative? At this point in time, You've got two answers to that. You've got the feel-good answer, and then you've got the realistic answer. And uh, the realistic answer is that fossil fuels have their place. And they will likely retain their place, probably for our lifetime. That's why, when I think of vehicles at this point, there's definitely the... I could understand that many have the appeal and the allure toward electric cars, but I think I just don't see it in many cases still as being as practicable as a regular gasoline-powered vehicle, or at the very least, if you want to, then go with a hybrid. So, that's how I see it in the immediate term. It's like, all right, here's something that I don't like about Tesla vehicles and a lot of electric cars at this point. I don't like that along with the electric power comes the total, it's like the car is more like a smartphone on wheels than an automobile, where it's like it's got this big touch screen and it... And I don't know, things are so connected through various apps and programs, that level of control. It just doesn't make me comfortable. I think, I guarantee that there's probably like a kill switch or something in that car. And someone remotely can press a button and it'll just shut your car off and you're going to be stranded. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, an old school, <laughs> old school car where you've just got the key, and as long as there's gas in the tank and it is, its technical specificities are met, uh, you're good to go. So, that degree of control or lack thereof is uh, distressing to me. And I don't like that. I don't like giving... leaving everything at the mercy of, let's just say, powers that be that I don't necessarily trust or that I think it's something that could and maybe will one day be abused. So that's how I see it. Or at the very least, it's something that could be abused by hackers or just ineptitude in general. And I remember there was a time where people got locked out of their cars because the app crashed. What an absurd thing that is. So there's a lot of things that need to be smoothed out and maybe one day there will be a car company that will get to prominence uh, that will kind of understand these concerns. 
and offer something maybe a little bit more traditional, even if things go and stray from the fossil fuel route, that it's not just going to be a glorified smartphone of sorts, but it'll be more like a traditional vehicle. I'd feel more comfortable with that, but that's just me, and that's kind of my, you know, I don't know what you'd even call it, a traditionalistic view of things in some ways. But, um, you know, we could talk about impacts and all of that, but still, when I look, okay, I might, I might want to be in rural areas. I might want to get away from it all. What if there aren't charging stations nearby? I've seen people that they want to take their... And I guess, are we even talking about vehicles in general? or No. So I'm just talking in this case, in, but we'll talk in general terms as well. I was just thinking about vehicles at first, because that's a, that's a big thing that you see a lot of it in reference to, anyway. But, um... Anyway, you see people that take these totally electric cars out into nature, and then they need to bring a charger for the car that needs to be powered by a diesel generator. And it's like, oh, that kind of defeats the purpose. So the prevalence of, let's say, those charging stations, that's one thing. Not enough of them. You see these enormous lines, and, uh... There's just things that need to be worked out in that regard. Now, generally speaking, a lot of the green energies at this point... I'm, I am for nuclear power. I know people, some people have their objections, but I think uh, I am supportive of, of nuclear power. It just needs to be managed responsibly, but I haven't a problem with it. There's a lot more things that are uh, more likely to kill us at this point in time than a nuclear power plant. That's my opinion. So, I think that needs to be harnessed more. I do think that, being realistic, even coal, it has its place. Even as a fallback. Uh, like you see in Europe, you have energy crisis at this point. Because of what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. And these are countries that generally laud various uh, goals in terms of leaving fossil fuels. But I think people can be optimistic, but just because you're optimistic about something doesn't mean you're actually ready for it yet. And what you're seeing now, talk of rolling blackouts. You're going to need to conserve your heat. There might be heating heat shortages in the winter. And st all of these struggles and hardships that are looming on the horizon, again, because of what's going on in Eastern Europe, we can talk all we want about how we've got to abandon this and abandon that. Well, it's time to walk the walk and, uh, just not ready yet. So, like I said, I the way I interpret it, there's the feel-good answer, which I think one day, maybe, you know, like I said, there's lots of predictions that people get optimistic for and then they never come to pass. People back in the 60s thought we'd have colonies on other planets by now. And uh, look where we are. So I'm not even totally ready to say that it would even be abandoned, but it, I think it'll probably take longer than you think. Now, that's one part of me that says that. It's just going to take a while, and I think people are eager, some people are, but it's just not going to happen as quickly as people think, 
want or expect it to. That's just how I see it. There's going to be a transition. There's definitely going to be a greater transition. And it's going to vary by location. It's going to vary by country. Some countries, I think, will at some point have a greater reliance on fossil fuels due to one reason or another, and others will kind of abandon them more and more. And uh, it's, it's going to vary around the world, but um, it's going to take longer than people think. And I think, I don't know, by the time we're dead, there's going to be fossil fuels still around. They're still going to be used widely, in my opinion. That's how I see it. It's just going to take longer than I think most of us would ever imagine. All right. Question two. You mentioned night walks in your previous podcast. Do you still enjoy doing them? Uh, I can't walk as much as I used to, and that's just due to my own physical limitations. But I still enjoy getting out at night. I'll still walk about, and I'll do all of that. I always go outside when I when I go outside at this point I've always got I've always got my guard up you know that's how I kind of look at things and I'm always very keen on my surroundings because you never know you never know so I always have multiple weapons and not that it's ever my intention to use any of them but just in case, because you don't want to be in one of those situations where, in that split second, you say, I wish I had this or that. So, I don't go out looking for trouble, I'm just going out to enjoy the night, and ideally be left alone, while leaving everyone else alone, too. But I like night walks, they're, they're very serene, they're very peaceful, and it's still something that provides splendid recreation and also the relaxation in a way, albeit I am exerting myself physically, but mentally speaking, it's a way that I can clear my mind a bit take in the atmosphere and the environment and the nice, fresh, cool nighttime air, admire the flora and fauna, and it can be relaxing, especially mentally. So indeed, I enjoy the night walks still. I've always enjoyed them, and I don't see it ever being something that I wouldn't enjoy. There's never been a time where I've thought, I don't like doing these night walks anymore. I've always liked them, regardless of where I am. So night walks, they're just my thing. You say, finally, I'd like to leave you with a fun alternative YouTube introduction that I'm sure you wouldn't use, but I would love to hear. All right. For you, Luke, in Brisbane, Australia, I'm going to read this. And I'm going to do it as I would if I'm starting a review. All right, I'm going to do it just for you. Roses are red. Violets are blue. This is Running On Empty Food Review. (laughs) So there you go. Thank you, Luke, in Brisbane, Australia, once again for your email. All right got that. Let's mark that as read and responded to. Todd writes in, Good afternoon. In your recent podcast, you jokingly mentioned that perhaps some listeners tune in to hear your off-the-cuff comments while you prepare to respond to mailbag questions and comments. I wanted to let you know that I do indeed look forward to hearing you verbalize the opening up of your email and the sipping of your water for some reason. Uh, It seems like a part of your public character 
or a brand, kind of like a regular introduction to the podcast or videos. So thank you, Todd. Uh, good to know that there's someone out there that, uh, you know, actually gets a little, a little something from that. So that's actually nice in a way, knowing that I'm not just wasting everyone's time. That now I know at least, hey, there's someone out there, and it's not like there's been any sort of mass protest because, oh, how dare you spend the minute sipping water and, and sifting through the emails, you know? Thanks, Todd. Glad you'd like it. All right. What is this? More spam. This one was clever. They made it look like... Now. Yeah. That one's going right in the trash. Some of these people get clever, but you know... The way they do it, they could even... Format the email in such a way that it may motivate you to click... On it. But upon actually reading its contents... You think, no, this is... B.S. Okay. Now Chris writes in, just says, wanted to compliment you on the great houndstooth jacket in the Little Caesars review. Thanks, Chris. Just a question, are you a fan of any other podcasts? Thanks for all that you do. You're the best voice out there. Well, again, thank you, Chris, for your sartorial compliment and kind words likewise. I'm not a big podcast listener. Uh, I'll listen to radio shows sometimes, but podcast-wise, I can't really say that there's anything that I listen to. Uh, sometimes I'll listen to various Sasquatch-themed podcasts. And people sharing. That's, that's the closest thing to any sort of podcast that I'll listen to. Uh, things that discuss Bigfoot encounters. And I'll listen to folks talk about that. So as far as that goes, again, I'll listen to that. Um, otherwise, I'll listen to radio. I'll listen to the international broadcasts on the shortwave. Uh, sometimes I'll listen to AM talk radio, and I'll listen to some of the paid programs that folks who buy airtime, like I do, on some of the stations like WWCR and uh, WRMI. Some of the shows are purely entertaining, and they'll have good music or commentary, where sometimes the subject matter itself will be so laughable, you know, those sorts of things where it's like, yeah, this stuff is, it's, it's, it's entertainment. And then there's other shows out there that are kind of more serious, or, you know, they'll make you think a bit, re-examine things, and, uh, and provide a little bit of perspective. But it's hit or miss sometimes. But either way, what I really do, like with the radio, is I'll scan around. I'll scan around and see what I can pick up, and then I go from there. Not really anything that I definitively listen to with any sort of extreme regularity. I'll say that. There was a time back in... 2014, I think it was, one of my favorite radio stations was Radio Kuwait, and I stumbled upon their English service one day, purely by accident. I remember, actually, the first time I ever heard Radio Kuwait. It was in the spring of 2014, and they would broadcast in English for three hours every afternoon. And it was beamed toward Europe and North America. And the signal would come in really strong because they would broadcast with high power, 500 kilowatts. And I was scanning around and I picked up this just exceptionally strong signal playing pretty contemporary music. 
And I thought, huh, I never noticed this broadcast before, let's see what it's about. And that's how I, how I learned about Radio Kuwait. So they didn't really play Arabic music. They would play Western music, but for three hours, it would be a blend of news programming. Uh, they would have cultural programs about the history, traditions, and uh, general culture of Kuwait and the, the Arabian Gulf area. And they would also balance it out with music. And it was always Western music, but it varied in era and genre. So you could be listening in, and one minute you'll be hearing a song by Donovan from the 60s, and then you're going to hear that back-to-back with uh, Lady Gaga. (laughs) Stuff like that. So it was just cool. And I liked it because even if I wasn't a fan of all the music, you never knew what you were going to get. And generally, I liked the playlist. They would play some pretty cool alternative rock. And I discovered actually some darn good music through Radio Kuwait. And they would broadcast from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern every single day. And I remember the frequency still. It was 15,540 kilohertz. And it would come in really clearly. So that was actually a station that they had the right frequency. And it showed, again, what shortwave was capable of. Getting a crystal clear signal in New York from Kuwait. So I made that a regular part of my day. And even though I was on a nighttime schedule when I would wake up, even if I'd miss the first hour of their broadcast sometimes... I would listen whenever I could. And then Radio Kuwait one day, as, uh... Here's the thing. They didn't stream online either. So, the only way to listen was on the shortwave. And that was it. And then one day, in early 2015, so I'd been listening for maybe like eight months, uh, they disappeared. And obviously transmitter broke, or they just pulled the plug, etc. And that was that. And that's how many shortwave stations leave the airwaves. And for the first half of 2015, I would check that frequency every damn day for Radio Kuwait to see if they came back. And obviously we know the trend with uh, shortwave broadcasting. They Usually when the stations leave the airwaves, they don't come back. Right? Even since I started listening, there's so many stations I could say that about. Voice of Russia, Radio Netherlands, Worldwide. Some of the stations still exist, but they're just not on the shortwave anymore. RTE, uh, out of Ireland. The English service of DW, or Radio France International. You could say this about Radio Serbia. Radio Belarus, Voice of Armenia, Radio Pakistan, Radio Afghanistan, Radio Nepal, the Bhutan Broadcasting Service, Lao National Radio, the Voice of Nigeria, Channel Africa, Radio Medi One from Morocco, Radio Tunisia, There's a station out of Libya, I forget the name there. Um, There's a station 250 kilowatts out of Chad. And it just goes on and on and on. How many of these stations have, have returned to the airwaves? Zero. So when something leaves, it's gone. And I thought, why would Radio Kuwait be any exception to that? So I would check, but it was really with futility. And I pretty much gave up because... 2015, nothing. 2016, nothing. Then mid-2017, I see this notice posted to a a shortwave broadcasting news site. said, Radio Kuwait receives new transmitters. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, no way. Of all the stations that left this medium, you're telling me that the one station that actually bucks the trend and comes back is freaking Radio Kuwait. 
You're actually telling me that that's the case? And indeed it was. That somehow, for some reason, they were the one station that reinvested in shortwave broadcasting, got new transmitters, and by mid-2017, were back on the air. English service and all. When, uh, obviously I was very eager to tune in, and, and that I did. And the only change with uh, their English service was they added a history segment, This Day in History, which discussed uh, historical events both nationally in Kuwait, but also worldwide that uh, occurred on this day, and I thought that was a cool feature. So that started back up, and uh, it's great to have them back. So I started listening again. But then, you know, you'd think some of this stuff is like money laundering. I don't understand how people can make these investments because these transmitters are millions of dollars and then do such a bad job managing them that they didn't know what they were doing. And then the transmitters started breaking again, not even after a few years. So at this point, the English broadcasts from Radio Kuwait are still going. The broadcast times have changed, though. Now they're on the shortwave from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. Eastern Time. And, uh, again, I could still listen. But these days, half of their transmitters are broken. I think it's just, you know, these are delicate pieces of machinery that require maintenance. And I figure they must have just gotten the transmitters and they just don't maintain them. They just have someone there that just only knows how to push a button labeled on and off, and that's it. So I'm sure that it's no wonder why they have so many problems. I doubt there's anyone there to properly maintain them. So uh, most of their transmitters are all distorted sounding, and the audio is like, imagine turning the bass up much higher than it ever should be, You'll have that, and it'll sound just really harsh and kind of crunchy and distorted. Uh, you'll have other times where the transmitter won't stay on the frequency, so the broadcast will kind of drift around and interfere with other stations. And they still have, like, one or two normal transmitters still. And uh, so it's all the luck of the draw, first and foremost. There's times where for months... It's just going to broadcast with this distorted audio, and then one day they'll decide to switch the transmitter, and you'll have it clearly, but it's all the luck of the draw these days, but it still goes out. They still transmit the English service on a daily basis, still not streamed online, and uh, you might say, well, haven't listeners wrote to them uh, about these issues? (laughs) <laughs> the way they are, if you write to their email address, it bounces back. It says that the inbox is full. So, they I don't think they care <laughs> one single bit. And uh, I'll still tune in from time to time, but these days the music variety has gotten less eclectic in nature. And it's like nowadays, it's 90% like Zoomer um, mumble rap, and that's about it. And I, I don't care for that, so I don't really listen anymore. Sometimes I'll tune in if I can catch it for the history show and the news, but even then, if the audio's all distorted and it's just difficult to tolerate, then what's the point? But uh, that was a station that, that was one of the few that I'd listen to regularly. Uh, These days, I'll kind of just check periodically. Like, I actually will say, last night, I did pull out the radio, and I scanned around, and I got to their frequency, but they were using a broken transmitter, so I didn't listen. And that's the extent of my Radio Kuwait listening in the last 24 hours. A week ago, I... uh, 
stayed tuned in for longer. I listened for about 30 minutes, but seldom do I remain tuned in for the whole three hours because it's like, why, why should I sit there and listen to two hours worth of music that I don't want to hear, nor would I derive any enjoyment in any way, shape, or form they're from, so why should I? So I don't. But that's the Radio Kuwait story. That was a broadcast that I would tune in um, to regularly. So not that uh, anyone could even tell, with the, with the exception that I'm now making a point of it, but I did take a bit of a break. Uh, actually, it's been a break of a few days. I wanted to let a few more emails come in, and that I did. So now I want to take a look at some more emails. These might I, This might be the last batch of emails that I'll read for this podcast, this specific show, not the podcast in general, just because, I mean, I realize, number one, the show doesn't have to be five hours. could be as long as I want it to be. And it's also getting toward the end of the month, and I, I kind of... Not that there's any set schedule for this program, but one show per month sounds pretty good to me. If I do more, I do more, but one a month at a minimum. I like the sound of it, but I'm not even going to say that's a schedule. It's been about 20-something days since I did the last show, and I want to give some time to go, um... Uh, what was I trying to say? To do the editing work and get everything taken care of, so... I guess it would be best if I kind of wrap things up after this recording session, and I don't really see a problem with that. Anyway, I guess we'll start here. Listener in Glasgow, Scotland writes, first time writing in, just wanted to mention that one of my favorite parts of the show is when you sort out the emails at the start of the mailbag segment. I find it to be very relaxing, and it makes me laugh when you say that you should have organized them before you started recording. Anyway, thanks for all the great shows. Look forward to them every month. All the best. So thank you for your thoughts there. Nice to have you listening in, and uh, glad you enjoy that aspect of the program. Oh, what else do we have? Got an email coming in from the other John in Manila, Philippines. Do you wear detachable collars? I'd like to know your opinions on them and what advice you have for choosing the type of collar for face shapes, if you have some. So thank you, John. My advice, and I'm sure that some some of these menswear experts, as they call themselves, are going to be beside themselves if they heard me, if they heard someone say this, because you get these people that are so rigid with this sort of stuff. Only go with this tie knot if you've got this sort of face, etc., etc. I say, no, forget that. Wear whatever collar that you want to wear. Who cares? It, it's, it's what you want to wear. So, me, do I wear detachable collars? I do. I do. I have a few of them. I'll tell you this, number one. If you want to get a detachable collar, I recommend one vendor and one vendor alone. I mention this not only because detachable collars are difficult to find these days. They're just... You know, not a lot of people wear them anymore. They're considered very formal, etc. But... The place that I've found that makes them, that does a great job, that isn't some sort of costume 
reproduction that isn't some sort of just cheap knockoff, that they make serious clothing is a, a company called Darcy Clothing. They are the only company that I use to get detachable collars and the shirts and everything for them. That's it. So, price-wise, it depends on your budget. You know, it might not necessarily be the world's most... It's not going to be the cheapest thing, but from everything I've seen, it's the best you're going to get. And I think that quality is important. So always go with Darcy clothing. In terms of the collars themselves, and since you're asking about them, I, I'm sure you're aware of how it all works, that you have the shirt, and then you have the two studs for the collar, the one for the front, which is always the longer one, and then the shorter one for the back, and that whole process. But in terms of the collars that I wear, I don't even think about face shape when any of when I consider any of this, I just say, which one suits the look that I'm trying to go for? And that's it. I don't think about face shape whatsoever. So what I always go with is the starched imperial collar. That's the collar that just is sticking straight up and has no folds whatsoever at the front. It's just completely vertical and stiff. So I will get those. The way I see it, the imperial collar is probably the most formal collar. And because formality in menswear has changed over the last century, things have obviously been very casual for a, a while now, I think only getting more so, uh, most people have never seen an imperial collar outside of black and white pictures in a history book or an old, or, you know, let's say a movie or television show that's supposed to take place in a certain period. Uh, people really stopped wearing the imperial collars uh, at the end of the Edwardian era, though, I mean, you had a few people usually older, who still, you know, wore them into the 1930s and even a few stragglers into the 40s, but by then they were already very rare. So that's really old school. But I like the look. So if you ever see me wearing a collar that's just sticking straight up, so there's no points in the front, that's always a detachable collar. Uh, that always is. And again, it's always the starched imperial collar. I don't go with the washable ones. I, I like the starched ones better because uh, it's just... It has a better firmness as far as I'm concerned. So I'll go with that. Uh, I will also... And usually when, it, when, when I'm talking about detachable collars, usually that's the one I go with. Uh, I do also have a starched butterfly wing collar which I just find interesting, so I'll wear that from time to time. Personally, I like the standard wing collars with the points better, but uh, the butterfly one is just unique, and I thought it would be interesting to at least have one. And then in terms of the wing collars, um, obviously I'd consider myself, compared to at least most people, a frequent wearer of, of wing collars, and I like wearing them with the necktie and the uh, four-in-hand knot. And those are a combination of shirts that have the collars attached and uh, collars that are detachable. So I go with a mix. In terms of the, de 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 the detachable wing collars, usually I will go with the starched standard wing collar. Uh, one thing just to be aware of, though, if you do go with the, the wing collar, the standard one, the points of the collar 
are essentially going to be, as the picture portrays, kind of pointing out. So if you want them pointing down and going slightly over the necktie, that just might not necessarily be what you're looking for. One of these days, I might get the uh, starched two and a quarter inch high wing collar just to see how that works out. That might be interesting. And I think one of these days I'll go with, uh, I'll probably get some more imperial collars at some point. The imperial collars, as far as I see it, again, are a very formal collar. And I would only wear them at this point with a three-piece suit, especially in a dark color, or with a vest and a frock coat, or other long uh, outer garment. I think they just look best when they're layered up. That's just my, that's just how I would wear them. Obviously, you could wear them the way you want, but I don't take face shape into account at all. It's, I think what you should do is look at the collars and think about which ones that you'd like. Now, if you're kind of a traditionalist, as I am in some ways, then obviously the imperial collars and the wing collars would, they might be what you're looking for. If you'd like, if you'd like something that's a bit classic and more formal, but isn't necessarily as um, rare, so to speak, then go with the uh, the turndown collars and it's just going to be, it's, it's going to look, you'll just notice that the collar is a bit more firm. I'm not a big fan of the turned down detachable collars, admittedly. And the reason being is because of the stiffness that they have. I, I've, uh, it's just a real pain trying to get the necktie between the collar itself and the band and, uh, it's, it's just a real pain. It's more trouble than it's worth as far as I see it. So that's why I don't really wear the detachable turn-down collars. Like I said, it's just such a pain to try to um, get a necktie under them. So I say forget it. But of the turn-down collars, my favorite would probably be the double round collar with the rounded points, but again... I do have one of those, but very rarely do I wear it because I just, I, I find it to be more trouble than it's worth. But that's just my interpretation of it. So good question. Uh, in the end, I think just wear what you're comfortable wearing. Look at the collars and think about which ones might suit you, not necessarily in terms of your face, but think which style do I like? Which would I be happiest and most comfortable wearing. And I would say use that as the basis in terms of making a purchase, should you do so, as opposed to just being concerned about face shape. But I understand that some people's views and priorities are different than mine. Like I said, as for me, I just don't care about my face shape or whether or not a certain collar has any effect on it whatsoever, whether it makes things look any better or worse, I really don't care. It's like, let's say, wearing a high imperial collar makes things look a whole lot worse. Well, if I like the collar, I really don't care what, what people see. I'm just happy that uh, I've got a collar that I like. So that's just how I, I view it. But I know a lot of people out there are really concerned with aesthetics and you know, does this suit me? Does this complement this part of me or that? Or does it accentuate this, that, or the other thing? Or hide this, that, or the other thing? Or make this look better or whatever? I'm just not that way. I say I really don't care what, what people think. I'm not going to be walking around dressed indecently. Um quite the opposite, but I don't care if people say, oh, you, you look uh, you look stupid in that collar. I think, ah, well, think it then, but that's not going to change what I'm wearing. Oh, good question, though. Thanks for asking. 
Eric writes in, was wondering if you'll be uploading more of the podcasts on YouTube. I've been listening nonstop lately and was curious. Uh, yes, indeed. Shows aren't going anywhere. They'll be uploaded to YouTube. But as I said, I, I, I do about one per month. But... So there's no schedule. But when I do a show, it'll be on the YouTube. So thanks for your question there. Just going through some recent emails, I just want to make sure I don't... that I don't miss something. Alright, this is just a kind comment. I don't have a shortwave radio, but I've been listening via YouTube. I must start off by telling you I'm 30 years old, local truck driver for Pepsi in Southern California, and I hate my job. Your podcast has been a big help getting me through the day. I find it astonishing that I can find wisdom in someone who's younger than me. It's no insult to you. I only mean to convey that because I believe you're a genius, though you're way too kind now. No way. Ideas and philosophies you profess, present are refreshing, especially for how young you are. Please assume that I'm a repeat listener, and I'll be listening until you stop your YouTube presence. Thank you for being you. Look forward to more. Well, thank you. The funny thing is, I, you've only got five years on me, but uh, I know what you mean. Thank you, though. Thank you for your kind words. You're too kind, if I may say so. Have an email coming in next from JD. Wanted to let you know I've been enjoying the latest podcasts and YouTube videos. A while back, I watched a documentary series on the strange phenomenon of Skinwalker Ranch up in Utah. Most of it was filled with reality TV nonsense. It was pretty disappointing. Uh, getting to my question, what are your thoughts on the Navajo legend of the skinwalker creature? Wishing you nothing but the best. From JD. So thanks, JD. Well, the skinwalker and the skinwalker ranch. As far as I know, I'm not going to pretend like I'm extremely well-versed about skinwalkers. I'm familiar, I believe, with the basic, the basic facts. I'm familiar with some of the legends. Wasn't there a, uh, an old creepy pasta written a while back, years ago, about skinwalkers? I know there was something I've read about that. And then the skinwalker ranch, when I, when I, when I read about that, but I might be getting it confused with something else, so I don't want to, to act as though I'm saying this definitively. But I remember whenever I would read about Skinwalker Ranch, it would be, um... It would always seem to not really have anything to do with Skinwalkers, right? A lot of the time when I would start going down the rabbit hole about Skinwalker Ranch, I would always find that the conversation would quickly shift from like skinwalkers or, or creatures to uh, like the Illuminati and secret societies, uh, human sacrifices, etc. And that's what it would usually kind of get to. And I would always find the subject of Skinwalker Ranch would kind of... It would almost take like a, uh, like a QAnon-type direction, if I'm not mistaken. But maybe those are just the interpretations that I was reading. But it seemed so... So varying that I couldn't really form formulate an opinion. Didn't... 
the ownership of the ranch at some point change, and then they weren't letting people on the premises or something like that. And it was a place where at least it was rumored that lots of strange things happened. That's that's what I know about it. And like I said, I'm not going to pretend, this is just off the top of my head, I'm not going to pretend like I know anything more about it than that. Now, as for the legend itself, some legends certainly have a degree of basis in reality. Some of them turn out to be completely true, and others are are totally fictional in nature. So... Now, if it were just up to me, I would just say, I don't know, I think if... There's a lot of things in this world that we don't know, and there's a lot... The way I see it, anyway, that there, there's a lot... left to be discovered. But I would say, personally, that I think there would be a higher likelihood of Bigfoot existing... than, uh... The skinwalkers. I think a lot of that is mostly... I think that that's mostly just legend. And like I said, maybe it's based on some old cautionary tales. But... Like I said, some things have a basis in reality, others don't. It's very interesting either way. Thank you for your question. All right, next we've got an email coming in from Justin in Portage, Indiana. Now, this listener, you might remember him. He wrote in the last program. He was the one with the uh, Domino's experience, with the uh, deplorable customer service experience there and the, uh, uh, the whole employee issue. So you're right. I wanted to give you an update on the Domino's Pizza debacle. You were correct in your previous podcast when you mentioned that many people would take the side of the workers who treated us so poorly. I was told by well over half of those I shared the story with that I had no right to record it and that I was in the wrong. And I was surprised to see a majority of the population appear to sympathize with those who are mean to other people, and that my recording it would make others so upset. Yeah, to interject, I'm not one of those people, but, you know, I've seen so many people that are this way these days that I'm, I can kind of, I don't know, get a, uh, people just are so adamant on defending bad behavior these days. But I think a lot of it comes down to uh, the fact that, whether they'll admit it or not, they kind of see themselves in that behavior, I think. So, that makes me... That's why I, I think one reason why uh, some people are so sympathetic to such degenerate actions, because whether they admit it or not, that's how they are as well. Uh, or at least they have some of those characteristics. And also it's just a thing to, for some reason, to continually make excuses for... Uh, sometimes who are all just generally awful people. And that's just a thing. You know, it's like sometimes I understand looking at certain things circumstantially, but I'm talking about people who just go out of their way to vehemently defend abhorrent actions and I just don't get it. It's like the other day, I'll give two examples, one of which is obviously very serious, the other though I don't think is good either. And in both cases I've seen people legitimately try to defend these people. Uh, there was one, there was this child rapist who was convicted of the horrid deeds he did. And you had people trying to say, well, and it's just the way some people say it. It was like, well, it was because of this, this, and this. I was thinking to myself, all right. 
maybe there were factors involved, but that doesn't change what was done. And don't sit there saying that, like, all right, that somehow outweighs what was done, and now because of that, you should be sympathetic toward this person. When you factor in the damage that was done to the victims, that they just make excuses, they, you know... Maybe there were psychological problems. Maybe there were drugs involved. But guess what? That needs to be addressed then. And it doesn't change a damn thing as to what was done. But people say it like, oh, that makes everything better now. And now you shouldn't, you you should be reluctant to throw the, uh, throw the book at this person. No. All right, then get him into a mental program and throw the book at him anyway. (laughs) It's the way I see it. I'm not one of those cancel culture people, but I think that serious bad behaviors, i.e. crimes, deserve accountability. And perpetrators thereof must be held responsible for their actions. It's like, all right, that's a serious example. Another example, something that's still wrong in my opinion, but not to that degree. There were people doing some looting in Los Angeles, which seems to be, sadly, uh, you just see this more and more all over the place. And you have people that act like it's no big deal. We're getting your car or home or any of that broken into, like that's just a regular thing. And you'll have especially these entitled celebrities or these people that usually won't admit it who are so sheltered it's like they've never had a problem in their entire life who will just blow this stuff off like it's no big deal it's like yes are these common problems sadly they are sadly they are but that doesn't mean that then you should just be Indifferent, I suppose, toward them. And how about you accept that these are things that happen all too frequently? Now start asking the why, and then the what can be done about it. But instead, people just kind of brush it off and say, oh no, maybe they deserve that, your car that they just stole, maybe they deserve it more than you do. Um... This, that, and the other thing. Oh, it's just a regular thing of living in a city. I think to myself, sadly, it is commonplace in many big cities. But I think, theoretically, we could be better than that. So how about we address why that's happening, and then what could be done about it, instead of just excusing it continually. And then I think to myself, all right, so fine. If you're sitting there, and you're so content with this, then you surely you wouldn't mind if you just sent these people by the busload over to your gated community, hook them up with some nice bolt cutters and wire cutters, let them in, let them go to town, right? You'll let them do that. Clearly, right? <laughs> yeah, give me a break. They don't care when they're not impacted. That's the truth. But yeah, it, it it's a thing where... A lot of people nowadays take the side automatically of, uh, and it's just, it's just the way society is, I don't know. They'll take the side of, um, what doesn't logically seem to be the case. So I know that a lot of people are that way. I try to examine the situation and get a rounded perspective, and I try not to jump the gun on a lot of things. Again, it was like... You know, you'll see a video sometimes of an altercation, and it's a short five-second clip, and it shows something being said or a, a punch being thrown or whatever, and everyone immediately jumps to the conclusion that, based on that five-second clip, the person seen in that video is obviously the one at fault, and the person in the wrong. And then a little later on, you'll get a minute-long clip that shows, actually, it turns out that the person who was 
Supposedly, the villain the entire time was actually acting in self-defense, but the camera was so sh- the, the 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 footage was so short that there was no context to the scene, and everyone made up their mind right then and there. And you see that a lot, and uh, time and again, there are some situations where again it's it's as direct as it gets, and it's exactly what it is. And then there's things where it gets a little murkier, but. When you get those situations, or even if something is extremely direct and you think, all right, obviously you can tell that this person is in the right and this person is in the wrong, you'll see a lot of people that will just side with the person that's in the wrong. And like I said, I don't know why that is. I theorize that it's because a lot of people, maybe they just identify a bit of themselves in the person in the wrong because this is how a lot of people are at this point. You know, I... Mind you, though, that I am of the belief firmly that we are experiencing a societal degradation. So that philosophy gets applied to a lot of stuff, and um, and I, I weigh that heavily. So, you know, there's that. But maybe people also do it for to be contrarian. Maybe people... I don't know. I don't know what goes through... I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what goes through people's minds. Anyway, you got me on a tangent here. Um, So back to your email. It just got me thinking about um, people who kind of take the other side, even when it doesn't really make much sense. But you do see that a lot. And a lot of people, I just feel like they've got their priorities in the wrong place. And... Anyway... I could go on and on. I want to just get to your email. You're right. Fortunately, the local Domino's manager immediately took action. I can say the employee responsible already had many complaints. My footage ended up being used to terminate his employment. And I got a free pizza. I love Domino's pepperoni pizza. Anyway, I wanted you to know that upper management did correct this as soon as they got the word... I think it's important not to judge the whole team for the actions of one person. Yeah, to interject again. You understood the context. Some people jumped the gun. And uh, clearly this employee had many other complaints. So it's not like you were going out of your way to try to start something and get this guy fired. This was clearly someone uh, who who shouldn't be in that position. And... uh, I bet the quality of that establishment is uh, probably going to improve now. And uh, the upper management, they they made the right choice as far as I'm concerned. Uh, You said, P.S. Also, if I may, uh, I'd like to share my thoughts about petitions. Uh, I find them to be important for many reasons uh, beside trying to get them passed. Currently... There's a petition to remove a powerful political figure, and even though this person cannot be removed, the petition allows us to see how many people care about the issue. Brittany Grinner is also a good example, as the petition to bring her home safely shows how many people are willing to take a moment to put their name on record and show they support her, along with a brief comment for all to see. Sometimes a petition can be used for a laugh, Uh, My point is, a petition much of the time is not so much about what the expressed demands are as much it is a way for the masses to show their support. So, uh, to interject... Yeah, I guess what I was trying to say about the petitions earlier in the last show was merely that it's not something that should be done to expect that if it gets the amount of signatures the results are guaranteed. It's like if someone wants to sign something, then sign it. But that's what I meant, that it's just not something that you should assume that, all right, I'm going to start a petition for this, that, and the other thing, and once it gets to such and such amount of signatures, then that means the goal was reached and the results are going to be achieved. You know, it doesn't really work that way. But I know what you mean in terms of getting uh, support expressed. So if it's real easy to sign, like I said, it's up to the individual what they want to do. All right, thank you, Justin, 
in Indiana for your thoughts and essentially your addendum to the Domino's update. This one I could really, I'm just going to, I'll get to that one in writing. It was about shortwave radio. I want to get to a couple more emails, and then I'm going to wrap things up for today. So then that'll be that. But I just want to take a quick look through the inbox and just see if there's anything else that I want to talk about. Uh, So let's just take a quick look. Let's see. I think I've been getting to most of them. But I just want to be sure. Okay. Separate these two. And I guess I'll go with that one. All right, that should work. All right, three for this page. Okay, let's get to them. John in Illinois writes, Thank you for the most recent edition of your podcast. I've been enjoying them on my early morning runs across the Midwest as a truck driver. Looks like we got a couple truckers that uh, listen into the, the broadcast, which is great. Always support what you guys do. You keep this country moving, in my opinion, and uh, a lot of people don't, they, they don't realize that. They don't realize just how important and truly essential your work is for not only quality of life, but even just the basic, the necessities. So I really appreciate all that you guys do. Uh, but anyway, you continue. A couple brief questions about your wardrobe. Can you please elaborate on your suit in the video dated December 27th, 2021, titled Taco Bell Should Be Ashamed of Themselves? I like it a lot. All right. First question. Let's take a look. Let's find the suit specifically. Because, I mean, I've got everything open, so let's check it out. There we go. Taco Bell should be ashamed of themselves. What did I try out? The Chipotle Cheddar Chalupa. I don't even remember that item, really, but clearly I didn't like it. Ah, yes, that suit. All right. So I'll give you the backstory of that suit. That's a gray, obviously a gray suit, a little bit of black in it. Uh, I paired it, of course, with a black vest, as I usually do these days, and a... uh, black pattern tie. So that suit, it wasn't... It's not like a designer suit or anything, nor is it any sort of recognizable brand. I found it in a thrift store in 2016 over in very far western Virginia. And it was a nice area. Not, you know, by nice I mean very pleasant. It wasn't any sort of wealthy area or any of that. It was just, it wasn't run down or anything. It was just a nice, quiet, rural area. And anyway, so I found it, and... It was just sitting there on the rack. I thought, this is a a decent suit. So I thought, I'm going to try it on. Now, I tried it on, and it, it fit pretty nicely. So I took a couple pictures of it after I had tried it on, and those pictures then got posted to social media. I posted them myself. And those pictures, a lot of you have probably seen, uh, they get shared a lot. They get, um, they get posted around a lot. And it's a vintage suit. But one thing that I don't think I ever mentioned that I will, I remember, funny enough, those pictures got a lot of criticism because of well, a few things. Um, the tie that I was wearing 
with that suit and the fact that there wasn't any belt and they said the shoes were silly. And I'm going to admit, I think the shoes... These days, I don't wear that style of, of shoe anymore. I have these... Uh, the, the shoes I wear these days are nowhere near as, as pointy, and it's just a change in my personal preference. But back then, I liked that type of shoe. Nothing wrong with it. Anyway, so the whole thing with the tie, a lot of people said, oh, the tie doesn't work with the suit, etc., etc. Well, you have to remember that day, when I took those pictures, I hadn't, I hadn't even bought the suit yet. So I was wearing a different suit where that tie worked with. And I just saw this suit hanging up on the rack. I tried it on. So I had no idea I was going to come across this suit. So the tie that I was wearing, it doesn't necessarily go with it because I didn't pair it that way. It's just something that I came across and I was wearing that tie with a separate suit. And, um, and that's the thing there, but... Yeah, the suit is all right. I mean... Admittedly, that suit gets a lot of uh, a lot of compliments, but I don't really wear it all that often. I think the last time I actually wore that suit was in late December of 2021 because it's a very heavy fabric. It's a little scratchy, and um, and that's why I don't wear it all that often. But it does get very very. Uh, positive reactions, and I like it too, but that's just the little background information about those pictures. They were just taken because I just tried the suit on, so, you know, if I took pictures right after I turned the camera off, I changed back into what I was wearing, which, again, was a different suit, then I took that suit to the checkout, bought it, etc. So that's the backstory behind that, uh, that series of pictures. Not that anyone really, I don't think people really care, but it's just something that came to mind. But anyway, now it's a suit that gets a lot of reactions, and, uh... Yeah, definitely a nicer suit, though. No doubt. No doubt about it. Sometimes you find some... some good stuff at the thrift stores. Uh, you also ask... Uh, secondly, and please forgive the question, is there ever a day when you check out of being the report of the week and just throw on a pair of jeans and a hoodie. <laughs> Thanks, and have a great day. Thanks, John, over there in Illinois, for your question. No, there never is, because the suits came before this channel ever did, so even though, obviously, the suits get, you know, associated with, um, with the channel and, and what I do, I dressed this way before I ever took to YouTube. So that's just how I am. Uh, I actually don't have a pair of jeans or a pair of shorts or any of that. So even if I even if I wanted to, not that I do, but even if I wanted to, I wouldn't even have the means to do it because I don't own any casual clothing aside from sleepwear. So <laughs> Taking that into account now, every day I just dress the way that I do, and obviously the way that I dress is extremely, extremely conservatively, but those sorts of standards I hold only to myself. You know, so that's just how I see it. I'll have these sorts of standards in, in dress, Again, based on, based on my appearance. I don't hold other people to such sorts of guidelines. But it's like, I'll, I'll give an example of just how kind of, I don't know, hardline I am, I suppose. I have not worn a pair of shorts under any circumstance in 13 years. I mean, that's how I have not worn shorts... Like I said, under any circumstance in 13 years. Because me, it just doesn't feel right uh, to have my legs exposed. Uh, it's just not, it's not comfortable to me. And it feels, I personally feel wrong. And 
I don't know, I just feel open and indecent and um, uncomfortable physically and mentally dressed in, in that way. Uh, so there's no way I could ever, I couldn't wear that to bed. I couldn't wear that publicly or privately. So I don't. And like I said, I just, I'll clarify again, because I know some people will find that extreme and ridiculous. I only hold those, like I said, standards to myself. But if anything, um, believe it or not, what was already kind of a formal wardrobe and kind of set of standards I have for myself actually got, over the last year, if you'd believe it, it got kind of more conservative, if anything, much more. Because if you compare, even in the videos, you start scrolling down and you start looking at videos, and I won't even say it at first, but I'll kind of see if you could pick up on a pattern, right? And we scroll down to, let's say, videos from 2020. And I'll just start, uh, let's just start here, okay? We'll just go through five videos and I'll talk about what I'm wearing. And, and that'll be that. All right, so in June of 2020, trying out Popeye's Buffalo Ranch Chicken Tenders. I've got on a white short sleeve dress shirt and a blue tie. Then the next video after that tried out Little Caesar's Stuffed Crazy Bread, June 7th, 2020, was wearing a very dark gray dress shirt, a black pattern tie. That's it. Did a video for Arby's Sweet Potato Fries, wearing a double-breasted suit, white shirt, red tie. Tried Papa John's Shacaroni Pizza. Again, white short sleeve dress shirt, silverish pattern tie. And then tried out DiGiorno's Croissant Crust Pizza, black three piece suit, white shirt, dark pattern tie. So think about those outfits, right? They sound, yeah, formal. Um, you might not really notice anything that sounds okay, so. Now I'll tell you the last five videos that I did, and then just see if you notice a difference. Taco Bell's new grilled cheese burrito review. So we're just gonna start there, August 22nd. A black three-piece suit, white shirt, red tie. The most disappointing fast food breakfast item, white shirt, brownish tan vest, again, a brown tan pattern tie. McDonald's $5 crispy meal, black three-piece suit, white wing collar shirt, green pattern tie. Little Caesars pizza review was going with a white shirt, red tie, black vest and pants, with a uh, houndstooth sport coat. And then the Arby's Hush Puppy fish strips, gray suit, black vest, white shirt, black and purple tie. Now, if you kind of tried to imagine each outfit, you might notice the difference immediately. But if not, what changed in the last two years is that all I ever wear these days, for the most part, are three-piece suits or vests. And if you kind of compare 2020 and even part of 2021 to present, I never wear shirt and ties anymore, just by themselves. And I almost never wear a two-piece suit. So any suit that I wear these days is either a full three-piece suit, that means it's always, it always has a vest, or any two-piece suit that I wear 
I throw in a vest anyway and make it a three-piece suit. And I only ever wear solid white dress shirts. And I also wear detachable collars or wing collars more often. And at the most casual, I will still always have a vest on. So that's the change. Things got a whole lot more formal in that regard that almost all the time now, I'll have a vest and a jacket as opposed to just a a regular shirt and tie. Like I said, the reason uh, is just how I feel. I just feel too indecent wearing a shirt and tie by itself. And even a two-piece suit uh, feels a bit indecent, in my opinion, at at this point. Uh, I don't like how, even if I have a jacket that's on, if it's unbuttoned, then all you have is a shirt, an undershirt under it, of course, but uh, that feels too open. So I need another layer there to feel more comfortable, uh, so that way I'll have a vest that'll then have that layer over my torso, so that way I can have the jacket unbuttoned and I won't feel open or exposed anymore. So to answer your question, no, I don't have those days where I just go all out and go casual. As, as a matter of fact, if anything else, it's gone It's gone the other way um, completely, and it's only gotten more and more formal with time. So that's just what I wear. Now, some people might say, oh, what about the heat and all that? Well, air conditioning is my friend, and... The heat doesn't particularly bother me either, but I'm not going around and, you know, running laps around the block or anything just like this either. So interesting question there. Emails coming in from CB, who writes, I've been a fan of your The Report of the Week channel for a while, uh, so I hope you don't mind me emailing. I recently noticed you began editing the eating portions of your fast food reviews. Those are some of my favorite parts. I often watch your videos while eating my lunch. Uh, Otherwise, my vote... I hope uh, you can put those parts back in. So thank you, CB, for your thoughts. I'll explain why I've been editing that out lately. Uh, Personally, when I do the reviews... I never mention, you know, I don't want the videos to turn into some sort of mukbang or eating show. Really, I hope for them to be hopefully informative and perhaps, if some wish to perceive it, uh, entertaining assessment of the items. And sometimes I'll have a lot to say. I'll sometimes throw in some jokes and stories and anecdotes as well. And... The videos can get a bit long. And lately, a problem that I've been having is that the videos were kind of getting too long, in that I'll sit there and talk for something for 15 minutes, but I'll eat for three, four minutes, maybe even five, and now I'll be sitting here looking at a 20 minute long video. And mind you, We're in the age where people are watching, on other sites, these little clips, and they think that a 30-second video is long. So, I was trying to figure out what's the right way to cut down on the length of these videos a little bit without trying to cut down on how I do the videos, essentially. I was thinking, could there be a compromise reached where, because I don't want to feel like I have to rush. I tried that with Burger King's Southwest Bacon Whopper review, and I feel like I rushed it, and I didn't like it. So I thought, well, what else can I do without feeling like, all right, I just, all I could focus on is making the video shorter, and that's all I'm thinking about, and then I forget things to say in the video, and it's just, I don't know, it's just not, um... 
It's not something I'm personally happy with. So, I thought, all right, the best compromise that could actually be done with minimal editing is to condense the eating segments of the reviews. There hasn't been a a large public outcry at all. I think, including your email, I might have received five comments about it on all platforms. Uh, One email, that's yours, one comment on Reddit, and three YouTube comments, I'm pretty sure. And that's it. And when you consider, you know, how many people these videos go out to, sure, there's more people out there that certainly feel that way. But it's not like I'm getting hundreds and hundreds of of messages and an absolute deluge of feedback saying I need to put these segments back into the uh, the videos. Now, every now and then, I'm still going to leave that in, just for the heck of it. But there are those instances where if I can cut what would be a 20-minute video that might just seem like a turn-off for... Um, some viewers, and they might think, I don't want to waste 20 minutes on this, and, you know, cut down, like I said, a 20-minute video to even just a 15, a 13 to 15, even 16-minute video, I will do that. And it's positively impacted the channel as well. So, that's why. But again, obviously, if it's an item... Because I still have the camera right there with me. And it'll still be rolling and stuff. So there are going to be those situations where obviously the camera is going to stay on the entire time. It's like if I am trying out an item that's going to be really spicy, or it has some sort of characteristic that's really potent, and something that you would, you know, that would elicit uh, an immediate reaction of sorts. I will not edit out the eating portion for that. So that would stay in there because it would be it would be critical to the review itself. But there are those times even trying out the burrito for that latest review, I just didn't really think that it contributed much to the video and it added an extra 5 minutes to the video's length and again I just didn't see much to it, and I thought, I think this video, because mind you, this is, this is what I do, this is what pays the bills. I thought, I think the video would do better if I edited that out. And maybe that hunch was correct, because of the last two videos, of the last ten videos I've done, I should say, this has been the second most successful of them. So... Maybe that change was for the best. But understand, I'm not trying to do this to to try to spite anyone. I'm not doing this because I want to deprive uh, folks of, of viewing the eating experience. It's just a change based on analytics that makes me feel more comfortable with these videos and being able to do them the way I want to do them. So... That's uh, that, that's my reasoning there. It might not be the world's most agreeable reasoning, perhaps, but I just wanted to explain the why behind it. And again, I look at the, the reactions, and it seems, again, like there isn't a huge outpouring against that decision, so that's another reason that's kind of... I, I feel comfortable with it, I should say. But I appreciate your, uh, your thoughts. And, like I said, even if I I won't necessarily change things up, I at least want to explain the why behind it. Ryan in Southern California. Just wanted to let you know I'm glad you've continued publishing your podcast. Your thoughts, open-minded and self-aware commentary on things is refreshing. Keep on keeping on. I grew up in the 80s and had an old AM-FM radio next to my bed as a child. I have early memories of listening to programs before falling asleep. Dr. Demento was a favorite. That often meant catching the last few minutes 
of Casey Kasem's Top 40, which preceded it. I then scan around a bit and usually landed on the heavy metal program that the local college station played late at night. There's something magical about catching snippets of talk shows barely coming in between stations and the almost alien sounds of interference and radio silence that I fell asleep to many countless times. My father had been in the Navy and had a shortwave radio from those days in the 70s. I remember it had a Masonite rear cover held on with leather straps with snaps on them, and inside was a paper printing of the schematic layout of the electronics in case one needed to repair it. It was fun playing with that and hearing foreign languages coming through from what seemed like worlds away in my tiny little place in a small town in the Midwest, late at night with a clear sky, no light pollution, and the vastness of the universe enveloping me. So thank you for sharing that. I thought that was a good radio experience there. JD who says, I don't have a question, just wanted to let you know I listened to the new podcast. The discussion about family entertainment pizzerias was very entertaining, and your comment about guys in rat suits cracked me up. While I always enjoyed going to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid, I understand how some children could be averse to animatronics. So thank you, JD. Glad you liked the show and uh, found that comment to be amusing. Email comes in from Brendan in Ottawa, Canada. Always refreshing to hear your takes and perspectives on life, and I can't thank you enough for encouraging me to explore random topics like Bigfoot, were rogue waves, I've I've had quite the time over the last week, so reading through people's description of encounters, and I'm just very excited to hear your recent broadcast, which again mentions the large toad monkey man in the title, your dedication to all of the shows, and the passion you bring to the microphone is infectious in the best of ways. So thank you, Brendan, for your kind words. I'm, I'm really, I really appreciate your continued listenership. I know you've been a long-time listener. And thank you again, most sincerely, for your kind words of support. Uh, this listener is checking in. A video of yours came up on my YouTube today, so I watched it and I have a few questions. Nearly four years... After this video came out, have your thoughts changed on the YouTube channel? Uh, so this was a video ref in reference to that I released in the fall of 2018. It was called Yesterday I Got Mad, Now What? And to give a little context just on my end as to what the video was about, I was at the time a bit frustrated because I felt like I was, I, I felt like I was letting these reviews kind of get the best of me. And I felt like I had to get a certain item to review at a certain time, and it needed to be uploaded by this date or else. And then I couldn't um, get a certain item when I felt like I needed to, and the stress and frustration caused thereby was enormous. So this was essentially my, my way of kind of venting about that, talking about the impact that had on me. So anyway, that's the subject matter of the video, and you have a few questions about that. Uh, have your thoughts changed on the YouTube channel? I agree with one of the top comments saying that viewers come to your YouTube channel for you rather than the food reviews. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you considered the second channel you mentioned again? Running a YouTube channel must be quite the thing to manage. I'd love to hear more about the short stories you mentioned in the video as well. I know you touched on the music you listened to on the podcast before. 
Uh, as far as mental health goes, I've been diagnosed with OCD, not the kind that people claim they have all the time because they like to have things orderly arranged. Hardly anyone knows because of the stigma you mentioned. I deal with social anxiety as well, and it's tough. Hope your mental health is in a better state nowadays. Have a good night. So thank you for your questions. So anyway, having explained the uh, context behind the video, uh, a few things. Obviously, four years ago, when that was happening, right, I didn't know how the next four years were going to play out. So I wasn't sure what direction I wanted to take things in. One thing that I will say, though, and people say this, and I disagree with them, though. I actually disagree. I'm sorry if you hear any banging noises in the background. I hear, hear the garbage truck going by, and that could usually be kind of loud. Anyway, we'll just we'll, uh, power through it either way. I disagree when people say that they watch the channel for me. Now, I think that the... Essentially, the way... here Here's how I see it. I think when it comes down to reviews, I've essentially uh, become a brand of sorts. In that people recognize me and may find themselves returning to reviews uh, because of that. I do not think, though, that people, that most people, I think that, that there are some people, but I disagree that most people watch the channel just for me. And I will back that by saying and the numbers prove this. That videos that I do that are not review-related perform considerably worse. Every time. So that proves to me that you will have a percentage of people, maybe I'd say 15 to 20 percent of the regular viewing audience, that will watch content, um that isn't review-related, but that does not speak for a majority. So, the demand just really isn't there. And when the algorithm is such a fickle thing, and every little thing definitely plays a role, uh, I find it difficult to be really motivated to do the other sorts of videos sometimes when I know that they're going to hurt the channel because, like I said, if what the people in the top comments say is true, then that sort of adverse impact wouldn't exist because, you know, it just wouldn't, um... There would be no negative statistical impact because most people would actually watch it. Uh, for me, you know, in that case, I could do random videos about pretty much anything, and uh, there would be at least a certain degree of consistency. They might perform as well as the reviews do, perhaps. But when they consistently underperform those videos and then have a negative effect on the channel more broadly... Uh, that's a problem, and that, that tells me that I think the top comments are people that they're, be, they're being nice, and they're being supportive, and I appreciate that. But at the same time, I, I just disagree with those assessments, because I, I just see one thing. And I could say one thing, but actually put into practice, the outcome is, is very different. So... You think of it like if you're if this is your job, right, and you're doing a job and you have something that you know at the very least will have consistency. Right? Consistency and you know it's gonna do alright. 
no matter what. Might do better than that, but at the very least you have a baseline that you know I could with high certainty guarantee that it's going to be all right if I go this route. And you could either do that or you can take the hunch from what someone is saying and maybe it sounds good, but you've done it before and consistency isn't there. And the... um And the results show that, right? I'm always going to go, when it's talking about buying groceries and keeping a roof over my head, tending to medical bills, etc., I am not going to go the route that might crash everything. Uh, I will choose consistency. And I would hope people understand for obvious reasons. Back in 2018, at this point in time... I do the reviews, and obviously that's what I do the most. So people can say, oh, you're, you're a hypocrite, you didn't learn anything from that experience, etc., etc. But I feel that I did, because these days, I don't let the subject matter of the videos make me want to pull my hair out and have the sorts of stress on my life that they did back in 2018. These days, I understand and I know, look, I know that I again have this sort of baseline and that the reviews, they are a winning formula that they do, that they do work consistently. And I try to be punctual, but I don't need to be first. So, As a result, I say, all right, I'm going to aim to get a video filmed this day and uh, try to work on that. And I'll I'll make that as a goal. You know, I I try to set goals, but at the same time, I don't sit there and say, I I always have a plan B. That's another thing that I didn't have back then. I say, all right, I know how, how these places can be sometimes and that, you know, there's that variability. So if I can't get this item, then I'll go with that one. And it'll be all right. That's actually what happened with the uh, grilled cheese burrito review. I originally wanted to get the Papa Bowls from Papa John's. And that was the plan. But little did I know, despite what was being actually published on the corporate website, the local Papa John's actually closed earlier than they... they, uh, said in their schedule. So I wasn't able to get my hands on them. So that that was a problem. And if this were 2018, I would have been freaking out. I would have said expletive, expletive. This is this is awful. I, you know, and I would be going crazy. I would feel like this is going to really hurt the channel and I don't know what to do now. Uh, and it, it would just really, really stress me out. I'd get into this sort of spiral mentally. But now, I thought, all right, well, that's all right. They don't have it. I've got plan B, and I always do at this point. And I, all right, that's fine. I know Taco Bell is open. They've got the grilled cheese burrito. I'll get all set up, get that taken care of, and uh, I'll get that out and then do the Papa John's thing next. So that's what I did. And that worked out just fine. So, I will say that I personally feel like my attitude toward what I do and being able to manage it better has certainly improved, and that's led to improvement on my end in terms of all of this. I think back in 2018, I I cared... I don't know the right word for it. I maybe part of me cared too much about trying to be an online personality. You know, I think there's definitely, I think there's there's truth to that, that notion. Because you look at the types of videos that I was trying to do in 2018, was trying for a time to kind of make the channel more into, yeah, some reviews, but I'm going to try to make the channel um, more about me specifically. 
And I don't know. I just don't. Another thing that's changed is changed is that I just don't care anymore about about any of that. I don't really want to be a a uh, personality. I'm fine just being the guy that does the reviews, and I kind of like it that way, you know. Do the reviews, and can keep the other stuff to the radio or to on uh, to this show, and and that's that. It's like, that's why I intentionally stopped doing the average day videos. I don't want people looking into my life. Damn it, I want my privacy. If I can, if I have such an option that I could easily afford it by not doing that video, yeah, I'm going to take it. I'd rather be the review guy than live in some sort of, I don't know, just have my life on display like that. No, thank you. So I guess it's just a kind of a contentment with where things are that also didn't exist back then. It was like, back then I kind of felt, no, I want the channel to be be more random videos and it should focus on me as a person and not the video, not the reviews. And that's changed where now I say, oh, you know, like I said, it's just I don't think about that anymore. I don't, I don't want it to be that way. So that was just a change in my own viewpoint toward my work. So that's how I see it. Not that I won't do random videos anymore. You know, it's like, sure, there's plenty of ideas that I have and plenty of things that I could do. But one problem also is... The, the absolute mess that things are in society these days and the, uh, the attitudes that people have. So a lot of ideas that I could have, I'm somewhat hesitant about because everything is so, uh, so biased and you do the wrong thing and um and that's it so that's the other thing it's like theoretically speaking i really like history but if i did a channel where i could talk about historical events even if it was my intention to be accurate completely accurate. At this point, well, what's the right history to tell? Because you get some people that want you to inject certain things into history one way or the other. You've got to teach history or talk about history with this lean to it. No, it's got to be that. So you're going to get accused by one or the other. And if you shoot straight down the middle, both are going to hate your guts. So that's the thing. It's like, uh, it'll just be, why didn't you mention this? You're this, you're that, blah, blah, blah. Politics, (laughs) let's not even go there. I could, you know, I could tell you all about my own predictions and methodology behind them. I do this stuff in my free time. But that would be an even bigger dumpster fire because it's a good way to immediately get a good percentage of people to hate your guts because that's just the way that it is now. I could talk about geopolitics and I do that to an extent and current events on the radio but even then if you try to just talk about what's going on you will spur heavy disagreement. But it's like, well, I know, at least with the food reviews, especially in these polarizing times, I can kind of, again, if I just do that, how can you put an agenda into food reviews? You can't, really. So people don't even try to discern anything, because it's like, what's it? You know, you're talking about the food. So that's good. 
and that and that works in that regard. It's able to reach uh, a broader audience without there being that chance, you know, for tons of fighting or whatever. And then anything that even has the slightest chance of getting people riled up, I kind of save for the podcast or the radio show, and those generally go out to a, uh, again, generally more understanding crowd that by and large, has the maturity to understand, you know, you just, you act uh, with, with greater civility than most, I would say. So, that's where things stand. And, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I'm just content with, uh, with where things are. I don't know if that made any sense, but, um, that's where things that's where things are and it kind of changed over the couple years but I'm I'm happy with it again. And I hope by the way that things get better on your end with the OCD and you brought up a good point I feel a lot of people with OCD well you know how it is it's totally different than what people it could be life altering it could just it could ruin your life. And in severe cases, it could be debilitating. It's not just, as some people will portray it, you'll have, like I'm looking at my desk right now, there's a couple pens here. Oh, I've got to have the pens uh, lined up. I'm so OCZ. It's, it's different than that. So I wish you the best, and I thank you for your thoughts. All right, for this show... Adjusted the microphone. Few last emails I want to get to, and then that's going to be that. So, this is the last call, and beyond that, we'll keep it all going into the next program. Maya writes in, first time sending an email, but I've been a listener for a couple of months now, hoping to see a new podcast soon. Currently re-listening to your latest episode. Hope all's well with you. Well, thank you, Maya, for writing in. Great to have you as a listener. And I'm pleased to say, as you're probably hearing this, indeed there is a new show out. So thank you for your thoughts there. Jamie in Las Vegas, Nevada, with a comment. I recently started listening to your radio show after years of watching you on YouTube. Your voice is very calming, and I enjoy the various topics you cover. Please keep doing these shows. I often listen while I'm working the afternoon shift into the late evening. I appreciate your work. So thank you, Jamie, out there in Nevada. Listening in. Thanks for your comment. Comment coming in from Ben. Was listening to your talk about Bigfoot in the previous episode, and it got me wondering... If you've heard of the stories from over here in Australia about big cats in the wild. I live in Victoria, and in regional parts of the state, there have been many a sighting of so-called big cats on farmland and such, but only very little evidence to back the stories up. A lot of the stories as to how these black panther or puma-looking cats made it here go all the way back to the early 1900s with those that might have escaped from traveling zoos and circuses that were popular at the time. As there aren't uh, really any big cats native to Australia, it's left many locals puzzled for years. Also, Carl's Jr. is now a thing over here and one just opened in my hometown. Uh, Would you recommend I give it a try? And give it a miss. Keep up the great work from Ben. Ben in Australia. Checking in. Thanks, Ben. I have heard something about the big cats, theoretically, in Australia. I don't know enough to really talk about it at length, but I have heard some of those accounts. It is interesting, and you know, one thing, and obviously you would be much better versed on this matter than I am, so I'll kind of leave this with you. The way that I kind of see it, I know that there is a lot of 
open space and very sparsely populated areas in Australia, would you wager that these areas theoretically would be habitable or provide perhaps a suitable habitat for these theorized big cats? Or just is it not... Is there no real, realistic way that they could survive out there? That, I think, is an important question to ask, and I think that would be a, that would play a major role in how I would view the situation. But that, that's just me. That's just my perspective. As for Carl's Jr., give him a shot at least once. They're not going to be the best place by any means, but... They're not bad, all things considered. As a matter of fact, here in the United States, you have two chains. You have Hardee's and Carl's Jr., and they're the exact same thing. It's just, I don't know why one has one name and one has the other, but they're run by the same company, same menu, same everything, pretty much. And I haven't had them in a while, mostly because I'm just not located near one at this point. But I really haven't had a problem with them. They're not one of those establishments that I would go to very frequently, but when I would, mostly for a review, but sometimes for the heck of it, I never really had a problem with them. So, like I said, if you get it, I, I don't think you'd be extremely disappointed or anything, I'm sure quality-wise, it would be just fine. Don't go there, though, expecting it to be, you know, some sort of, of life-changing experience. So, that's, uh, that's my thoughts there. Theo is writing in next with question. I remember you mentioning an interest in astronomy, which is something I like to research and think about as well. Had a couple questions on that note. Firstly, do you stargaze? And if so, have you observed any interesting phenomena in the sky? Not really in the sense of UFOs, so that's interesting, too. Just anything you might have found notable. I know that we're all looking at the same sky, but we have different perspectives. So it'd be nice to hear yours. Uh, so first question to interject there. In terms of stargazing, I wouldn't consider myself a professional. So I'll say this, like, I'm not one of those people that can look up at the sky, and they could just point out every star that they see by name. Uh, obviously, I'm familiar with the major constellations and whereabouts they're located, but I, I can't just look at every little thing and say, oh, that's, you know, that, and that's, etc., etc. But anyway, I've I've seen what I would consider to be anyway some some cool things. I always like the meteor showers. Those are a lot of fun. My favorite meteor shower has always been the Perseids. That's just my personal favorite. Uh, the Perseids are always my favorite meteor shower. Although the Geminids are pretty solid as well, I must say. Otherwise, I mean, obviously seeing the different planets and whatnot, being able to look and see Mars or Saturn, etc. I mean, that's, that's fun. That's, that's just fun. I remember finally being in areas where there isn't a ton of light pollution and being able to see the Milky Way, that's an awesome experience right there. And I remember one time, I'll submit, that it was only because there was an experienced professional astronomer there uh, who was able to point out the Andromeda galaxy, being able to see that with the naked eye, which I'm pretty sure that's the furthest object that you can see, again, without the aid of any sort of telescope, the Andromeda galaxy. So that was a lot of fun as well. I thought that was really cool. UFO-wise, 
I don't know if you know. I don't know what this is. This is just an interesting thing, that probably some government aircraft. If I had to guess, that's my that's my wager. I remember not quite a year ago, I was outside late at night, and I was having a little fire. And I had the radio next to me, and I was just you know taking in the ambiance, enjoying the flames. Even, you know, the little smoke smells that doesn't bother me. It's very pleasant. Doing some late night listening out there, just taking in the night air. And it was very serene, as one can imagine. And I was looking at the sky, and I remember far off in the distance, obviously high up, but real far away, it was like on the horizon, you know, kind of as far as you could see. There was this bright light had to be like a good hundred miles from me, if I had to guess, at least. And it was moving very slowly, but it wasn't... Because I know people right then and there, they'll think, oh, that was a satellite, right? But it wasn't like that. It was moving more akin to how a helicopter would move. Where it would move a little bit, then it would stop. It wasn't a very gradual, continuous motion. It would move a little, then it would stop, and it would stay stationary for a long time. And I was out there for hours, and it would only move very slightly, and it mostly stayed in the same spot. It was real high up, and I don't know what that was. I don't know if it was some sort of drone, helicopter, or spy plane, or or experimental aircraft, but whatever it was, it was up high, but it wasn't really going anywhere. And that was fascinating. That was just an interesting... If that's the closest thing I've seen... That's probably the closest thing I'd ever seen to a UFO. And I checked the radars and stuff. Nothing came up. So... Probably government. But it was interesting, either way. Uh, Now, you also asked the question, I've been thinking about periodic comets lately. Uh, The most famous example, of course, being Halley's Comet. I often see it mentioned that it's possible to see Halley's Comet twice in a lifetime. But for someone like me, born in the late 90s, it's definitely a -a once-in-a-lifetime affair, and something that people of our age group probably wouldn't think about for the most part. (laughs) Anyway, is Halley's Comet something that you'd really look forward to seeing when it passes by Earth again in 2061? Or does it not stir your interest as much? Have to wonder if anyone would plan that far ahead. I just find something about it profound and beautiful, this constant from outer space that will come back to visit us generation after generation, no matter how things change here on Earth. Thank you for your thoughts. It is interesting to hear. Well, thank you, Theo. I think your thoughts are interesting, too, and it's good to hear from you. I think it's interesting. I think that those sorts of comets are fascinating, if you ask me. And certainly, if I'm still around in 2061, and obviously we haven't any guarantees, but should I still be here on this Earth, then I would definitely make the effort to try to the best of my ability uh, get some viewing of it in. So that's definitely something that I would find interesting and would make I would make the effort to try to to see it. Haley's comet I'm not sure how how uh, true this is. This is just a notion and I'm I'm sure I just I'm sure I just heard this from someone and that's how it's in my mind that when Halley's Comet made the rounds in the late 80s, the viewing was very subpar, and some people thought it was just hyped up for nothing, but that it just wasn't it wasn't in a good position. Now, that, I might be wrong about that, but that's just what my memory serves. I remember hearing about that. So who knows, maybe in... If that is the case, maybe in, in 2061 the uh, viewing would be much more favorable. I do also remember, though, people saying that 
Comet Hale Pop was really something and was one of the best to see. And that's that's a comet that I wish I could have seen. Cause that really sounds it just really sounds amazing. I know that Hellbop, that was associated with the Heaven's Gate as well, wasn't it? Didn't they think it was like a, a spaceship or something, so they all killed themselves? I think it was was Hellbop that that was uh in regards to Yeah, that one though. <laughs> yeah, I missed it, and there, there there is no shot that any of us are ever going to be seeing that again. It said that the next time it would return to the inner solar system would be in the year forty three eighty five. <laughs> so there's so a long ways away, but absolutely these sorts of celestial objects. They're fascinating to me, too. Good question there. I think we're getting to the end of things. Let's just see. Yeah, I think this is going to be the last one that I'll read, and then that'll be that for the show. Email coming in from Daniel in Western Australia uh, with a few comments and I'll just give my perspective, because there's definitely... I think you raised some good points, and I'll, I'll just explain my, my, my take on this. You're right. I've had a desire to rediscover shortwave radio, and your podcast episode talking about it inspired me to look into and commit to pursuing a new unit to listen to yours and other shows. I write you with my own feelings and opinions on your opinion that Radio Australia re-engaging and coming back to the Asia-Pacific region is, quote, a waste of time, unquote. I do understand your arguments in regards to the logistics, expense, and listener metrics, however, I really must, as an Australian aged 45, weigh in on the massive strategic value of Radio Australia to the Asia-Pacific region in regards to influence and public opinion. In a time when China seems to be rather aggressively pushing into the Pacific, into island regions, which have traditionally looked to Australia as the light on the hill, and indeed have relied heavily on Australian aid and subsidies to function, the return of Radio Australia would be a massive breath of fresh air. A huge part of this due to the fact that listeners in past years have been acutely aware that the VOA, Voice of America, and other shortwave radio providers have been heavily biased and propagandistic. This even includes the BBC. For reasons I don't claim to understand, Radio Australia was and is always known as a highly reputable and unbiased news source. The return of Radio Australia in the Asia-Pacific region may seem like a waste of time to a for-profit host like yourself, but in the scheme of regional influence and all that's attached, the return of Radio Australia to the Asia-Pacific would be a massive breath of fresh air to the region. So thanks, Daniel. Western Australia for some Radio Australia thoughts. So by and large, I'll say this right off the bat, I pretty much agree with everything you wrote here. The only thing that I'd say I disagree with, and then I'll attempt to better clarify where my frustrations stem, I don't know if I would necessarily consider Radio Australia to be any more unbiased at this point than the VOA with the BBC or China Radio International, I think that they definitely have bias and spin. And that I say just as someone who used to be a regular listener of theirs. They got some darn good music programs, and uh, they do have some good Pacific-oriented programs, like Pacific Beat, I'm pretty sure. Might be getting the station wrong. Let me look. 
Now that is, that is an ABC program. Yeah, Pacific Beat is real solid, and those are the types of programs that you need to have on the shortwave over to the Pacific. But I've always thought that there is some sort of spin or, or bias that they have, but that's just my two cents. And otherwise, my criticisms really came from... It was like a frustration saying, well, I don't think they understand what the whole process of getting Radio Australia back on the air really entails entails because so stupidly in 2017 they shut the thing down they sold the transmitting site and they gutted it the thing it's sold to developers so a lot of my frustrations about it being a waste of time come from that because you get people who act like it's just a matter of turning the transmitters back on but it's it's worse than that it's about getting all of the infrastructure that really uh, should still be there and it isn't anymore. So a lot of it is just frustration, kind of like, look what you got yourselves into. You never should have shut the thing down in the first place. Look, this is, this is what you get for doing these stupid things. You know, it's kind of like that. And it's just very frustrating. It's just they don't realize how far back the idiocy those years ago, just how far back it set them. And it's just going to be a real process to try to get this get this back. But, I mean, I would still... I think also analytically and all of that, you know, it's... Um, they wouldn't have as many listeners. And, and cost-wise, I mention that because... They, they were very specific about the amounts of money that they wanted to dedicate to trying to, to bring it back. And when I saw the amount, it surprised me because I thought, I don't think, given the circumstance, that's going to be enough to result in really anything. So that's where my criticisms really stemmed from. But yeah, I, I think Radio Australia should come back. I think they should... Follow in the footsteps of Radio New Zealand and make sure that they have programming specifically suited for listeners in the Pacific. And that's what they got to do. They, they can't do any of this half-assed relaying of just a domestic service to Australia. You got to have special, specific programs tailored to shortwave listeners, again, across the Pacific region. That's how I see it, anyway. On a final note, if you remember um, the massive volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga earlier in the year, number one, that volcano, that eruption was insane. And it actually caused it caused a tsunami, obviously, but it caused almost something that might even be defined as a mega tsunami. Because you know, you factor in the volcano is underwater pretty much. So that explosion, the water had to go somewhere. And in the immediate area around that volcano, I think they said there was a tsunami about three hundred feet in height. I mean, could you imagine that? That's insane. It's like, reminds me of that, that scene in the movie Interstellar. This giant wall of water, because that's what that would be. And I guarantee, if that tsunami at that height made it to most of the islands in Tonga, pretty much everyone on that island would be dead. How could they not be with a 300-foot tsunami but thankfully it kind of it got smaller before it reached them uh, but there's a good article about radio new zealand it says a vital tool why radio new zealand 
turned to shortwave after the Tongan eruption. And they've always been on the shortwave, but, you know, it's the same reasons we all know. After that eruption and tsunami in Tonga, no internet, no electricity, no cell phones, no television, nothing. So to get that news in, shortwave, that's the only thing that gets it out, that gets news and information out in that circumstance. And likewise, in the immediate aftermath of the the eruption, Radio New Zealand did an excellent job trying to alert shortwave listeners there about the tsunami and try to update them about what's going on and, again, keep everyone in the know that there is what could be a major tsunami spreading across the region. And that sort of information, especially on a platform that's only that's the only thing left, that, that's life-saving information. And I'm positive that those shortwave broadcasts of Radio New Zealand probably saved lives. Almost certain they did. You know, back in 2004, when you had the Indian Ocean tsunami, which killed about 200, 230,000 people, what killed a lot of people was lack of warning. And no one was reporting about that tsunami, even on the shortwave. I was doing some reading. There were almost no broadcasts warning people about the tsunami, so a lot of people didn't even know. So it's good to see how things have changed, even if the medium isn't as, as uh, prevalent anymore, that some stations are kind of they're doing the right thing. So I'd like to see Radio Australia back. I hope that they, they come back. I hope they, again, follow Radio New Zealand's approach and have that programming specifically tailored for listeners in the Pacific. So with that, I think that's all that I have for you in today's show. Thank you all so much for listening in. Any feedback, again, is welcome. V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com Until next time, be safe, be healthy, and I wish you all the very best. Take care. This is VORW.